Chapter 1. Laying Plans Tiaseo Kung, in defining the meaning of the Chinese for the title of this chapter, says it refers to the deliberations in the temple selected by the general for his temporary use, or as we should say, in his tent. C. 26. 1. Sun Tzu said, The art of war is of vital importance to the state. 2. It is a matter of life and death, a road either to safety or to ruin. Hence it is a subject of inquiry which can on no account be neglected. 3. The art of war, then, is governed by five constant factors, to be taken into account in one's deliberations, when seeking to determine the conditions obtaining in the field. 4. These are, 1. The moral law, 2. Heaven, 3. Earth, for the commander, 5. Method and discipline. It appears from what follows that Sun Tzu means by moral law, a principle of harmony, not unlike the Tao of Lao Tzu in its moral aspect. One might be tempted to render it by morale, were it not considered as an attribute of the ruler in 13. 5. 6. The moral law causes the people to be in complete accord with their ruler, so that they will follow him regardless of their lives, undismayed by any danger. Tuyu quotes Wang Tzu as saying, Without constant practice, the officers will be nervous and undecided when mustering for battle. Without constant practice, the general will be wavering and irresolute when the crisis is at hand. 7. Heaven signifies night and day, cold and heat, times and seasons. The commentators, I think, make an unnecessary mystery of two words here. Meng Shi refers to the hard and the soft, waxing and waning, of heaven. Wang Shi, however, may be right in saying that what is meant is the general economy of heaven including the five elements, the four seasons, wind and clouds, and other phenomena. 8. Earth comprises distances, great and small, danger and security, open ground and narrow passes, the chances of life and death. 9. The commander stands for the virtues of wisdom, sincerity, benevolence, courage and strictness. The five cardinal virtues of the Chinese are 1. Humanity or benevolence, 2. Uprightness of mind, 3. Self-respect, self-control, or proper feeling. For wisdom. 5. Sincerity or good faith. Here, wisdom and sincerity are put before humanity or benevolence, and the two military virtues of courage and strictness substituted for uprightness of mind and self-respect, self-control, or proper feeling. 10. By method and discipline are to be understood the marshalling of the army in its proper subdivisions, the gradations of rank among the officers, the maintenance of roads by which supplies may reach the army, and the control of military expenditure. 11. These five heads should be familiar to every general. He who knows them will be victorious. He who knows them not will fail. 12. Therefore, in your deliberations, when seeking to determine the military conditions, let them be made the basis of a comparison, in this wise. 13. One which of the two sovereigns is imbued with the moral law? I. Is in harmony with his subjects. CF 5. To which of the two generals has most ability? 3. With whom lie the advantages derived from heaven and earth? C. 7. 8. 4. On which side is discipline most rigorously enforced? Tu Mu alludes to the remarkable story of Tiaseo Tiaseo A.D. 155-220, who was such a strict disciplinarian that once, in accordance with his own severe regulations against injury to standing crops, he condemned himself to death for having allowed his horse to shy into a field of corn. However, in lieu of losing his head, he was persuaded to satisfy his sense of justice by cutting off his hair. Tiaseo Tiaseo's own comment on the present passage is characteristically curt. When you lay down a law, see that it is not disobeyed. If it is disobeyed, the offender must be put to death. 5. Which army is the stronger? Morally as well as physically. As May Yao Chn puts it, freely rendered. Esprit de corps and big battalions. 6. On which side are officers and men more highly trained? 2. You quotes Wang Tzu as saying, Without constant practice, the officers will be nervous and undecided when mustering for battle. Without constant practice, 
the general will be wavering and irresolute when the crisis is at hand. 7. In which army is there the greater constancy both in reward and punishment? On which side is there the most absolute certainty that merit will be properly rewarded and misdeeds summarily punished? 14. By means of these seven considerations I can forecast victory or defeat. 15. The general that hearkens to my counsel and acts upon it, will conquer, let such a one be retained in command. The general that hearkens not to my counsel nor acts upon it, will suffer defeat, let such a one be dismissed. The form of this paragraph reminds us that Sun Tzu's treatise was composed expressly for the benefit of his patron Ho Lu, king of the Wu state. 16. While heeding the profit of my counsel, avail yourself also of any helpful circumstances over and beyond the ordinary rules. 17. According as circumstances are favorable, one should modify one's plans. Sun Tzu, as a practical soldier, will have none of the bookish theoric. He cautions us here not to pin our faith to abstract principles. 4. As Chan Yu puts it, while the main laws of strategy can be stated clearly enough for the benefit of all and sundry, you must be guided by the actions of the enemy in attempting to secure a favorable position in actual warfare. On the eve of the Battle of Waterloo, Lord Uxbridge, commanding the cavalry, went to the Duke of Wellington in order to learn what his plans and calculations were for the morrow, because, as he explained, he might suddenly find himself commander-in-chief and would be unable to frame new plans in a critical moment. The duke listened quietly and then said, Who will attack the first tomorrow, I or Bonaparte? Bonaparte, replied Lord Uxbridge. Well, continued the duke, Bonaparte has not given me any idea of his projects, and as my plans will depend upon his, how can you expect me to tell you what mine are? 1. 18. All warfare is based on deception. The truth of this pithy and profound saying will be admitted by every soldier. Colonel Henderson tells us that Wellington, great in so many military qualities, was especially distinguished by the extraordinary skill with which he concealed his movements and deceived both friend and foe. 19. Hence, when able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must seem inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. When far away, we must make him believe we are near. 20. Hold out baits to entice the enemy. Feign disorder and crush him. All commentators except Chan Yu say, When he is in disorder, crush him. It is more natural to suppose that Sun Tzu is still illustrating the uses of deception in war. 21. If he is secure at all points, be prepared for him. If he is in superior strength, evade him. 22. If your opponent is of choleric temper, seek to irritate him. Pretend to be weak, that he may grow arrogant. Wang Tzu, quoted by Tu Yu, says that the good tactician plays with his adversary as a cat plays with a mouse, first feigning weakness and immobility, and then suddenly pouncing upon him. 23. If he is taking his ease, give him no rest. This is probably the meaning though Mei Yao Chen has the note. While we are taking our ease, wait for the enemy to tire himself out. The Yulan has. Lure him on and tire him out. If his forces are united, separate them. Less plausible is the interpretation favored by most of the commentators. If sovereign and subject are in accord, put division between them. 24. Attack him where he is unprepared, appear where you are not expected. 25. These military devices, leading to victory, must not be divulged beforehand. 26. Now the general who wins a battle makes many calculations in his temple ere the battle is fought. Chan Yu tells us that in ancient times it was customary for a temple to be set apart for the use of a general who was about to take the field, in order that he might there elaborate his plan of campaign. The general who loses a battle makes but few calculations beforehand. Thus do many calculations lead to victory, and few calculations to defeat. How much more no calculation at all. It is by attention to this point that I can foresee who is likely to win or lose. 1. Words on Wellington by Sir W. Fraser Chapter 2. Waging War 
Ti Seo Kung has the note. He who wishes to fight must first count the cost. Which prepares us for the discovery that the subject of the chapter is not what we might expect from the title, but is primarily a consideration of ways and means. 1. Sun Tzu said, In the operations of war, where there are in the field a thousand swift chariots, as many heavy chariots, and a hundred thousand mail-clad soldiers. The swift chariots were lightly built and, according to Chan Yu, used for the attack. The heavy chariots were heavier and designed for purposes of defense. Li Xiechuan, it is true, says that the latter were light, but this seems hardly probable. It is interesting to note the analogies between early Chinese warfare and that of the Homeric Greeks. In each case, the war chariot was the important factor, forming as it did the nucleus round which was grouped a certain number of foot soldiers. With regard to the numbers given here, we are informed that each swift chariot was accompanied by seventy-five footmen, and each heavy chariot by twenty-five footmen, so that the whole army would be divided up into a thousand battalions, each consisting of two chariots and a hundred men, with provisions enough to carry them a thousand li. 2.78 modernly go to a mile. The length may have varied slightly since Sun Tzu's time. The expenditure at home and at the front, including entertainment of guests, small items such as glue and paint, and some spent on chariots and armor, will reach the total of a thousand ounces of silver per day. Such is the cost of raising an army of one hundred thousand men. 2. When you engage in actual fighting, if victory is long in coming, the men's weapons will grow dull and their ardor will be damped. If you lay siege to a town, you will exhaust your strength. 3. Again, if the campaign is protracted, the resources of the state will not be equal to the strain. 4. Now, when your weapons are dulled, your ardor damped, your strength exhausted and your treasure spent, other chieftains will spring up to take advantage of your extremity. Then no man, however wise, will be able to avert the consequences that must ensue. 5. Thus, though we have heard of stupid haste in war, cleverness has never been seen associated with long delays. This concise and difficult sentence is not well explained by any of the commentators. Tseo Kung, Li Xiechuan, Meng Shi, Tu Yu, Tu Mu and Mei Yao Chen have notes to the effect that a general, though naturally stupid, may nevertheless conquer through sheer force of rapidity. Ho Shi says, Haste may be stupid, but at any rate it saves expenditure of energy and treasure. Protracted operations may be very clever, but they bring calamity in their train. Wan Shi evades the difficulty by remarking, Lengthy operations mean an army growing old, wealth being expended, an empty exchequer and distress among the people. True cleverness ensures against the occurrence of such calamities. Chang Yu says, So long as victory can be attained, stupid haste is preferable to clever dilatoriness. Now Sun Tzu says nothing whatever, except possibly by implication, about ill-considered haste being better than ingenious but lengthy operations. What he does say is something much more guarded, namely that, while speed may sometimes be injudicious, tardiness can never be anything but foolish if only because it means impoverishment to the nation. In considering the point raised here by Sun Tzu, the classic example of Fabius Cunctator will inevitably occur to the mind. That general deliberately measured the endurance of Rome against that of Hannibal's isolated army, because it seemed to him that the latter was more likely to suffer from a long campaign in a strange country. But it is quite a moot question whether his tactics would have proved successful in the long run. Their reversal, it is true, led to Canny, but this only establishes a negative presumption in their favor. 6. There is no instance of a country having benefited from prolonged warfare. 7. It is only one who is thoroughly acquainted with the evils of war that can thoroughly understand the profitable way of carrying it on. That is, with rapidity. Only one who knows the disastrous effects of a long war can realize the supreme importance of rapidity in bringing it to a close. Only two commentators seem to favor this interpretation, but it fits well into the logic of the context, whereas the rendering. He who does not know the evils of war cannot appreciate its benefits is distinctly pointless. 8. The skillful soldier does not raise a second levy, either are his supply wagons loaded more than twice. Once war is declared, 
he will not waste precious time in waiting for reinforcements, nor will he return his army back for fresh supplies, but crosses the enemy's frontier without delay. This may seem an audacious policy to recommend, but with all great strategists, from Julius Caesar to Napoleon Bonaparte, the value of time that is, being a little ahead of your opponent has counted for more than either numerical superiority or the nicest calculations with regard to commissariat. 9. Bring more material with you from home, but forage on the enemy. Thus the army will have food enough for its needs. The Chinese word translated here as war material literally means things to be used and is meant in the widest sense. It includes all the impedimenta of an army, apart from provisions. 10. Poverty of the state exchequer causes an army to be maintained by contributions from a distance. Contributing to maintain an army at a distance causes the people to be impoverished. The beginning of this sentence does not balance properly with the next, though obviously intended to do so. The arrangement, moreover, is so awkward that I cannot help suspecting some corruption in the text. It never seems to occur to Chinese commentators that an emendation may be necessary for the sense, and we get no help from them there. The Chinese words Sun Tzu used to indicate the cause of the people's impoverishment clearly have reference to some system by which the husbandmen sent their contributions of corn to the army direct. But why should it fall on them to maintain an army in this way, except because the state or government is too poor to do so? 11. On the other hand, the proximity of an army causes prices to go up, and high prices cause the people's substance to be drained away. 1. She says high prices occur before the army has left its own territory. Tseo Kung understands it of an army that has already crossed the frontier. 12. When their substance is drained away, the peasantry will be afflicted by heavy exactions. 13. 14. With this loss of substance and exhaustion of strength, the homes of the people will be stripped bare, and three-tenths of their incomes will be dissipated. To Mu and Wang she agree that the people are not mulcted not of March 10th, but of seven-tenths of their income. But this is hardly to be extracted from our text. Ho she has a characteristic tag. The people being regarded as the essential part of the state, and food as the people's heaven, is it not right that those in authority should value and be careful of both? While government expenses for broken chariots, worn-out horses, breastplates and helmets, bows and arrows, spears and shields, protective mantlets, draft oxen and heavy wagons, will amount to four-tenths of its total revenue. 15. Hence a wise general makes a point of foraging on the enemy. One cart load of the enemy's provisions is equivalent to twenty of one's own and likewise a single pickle of his provender is equivalent to twenty from one's own store. Because twenty cartloads will be consumed in the process of transporting one cartload to the front. A pickle is a unit of measure equal to 133.3 pounds 65.5 kilograms. 16. Now in order to kill the enemy, our men must be roused to anger. That there may be advantage from defeating the enemy, they must have their rewards. Tumu says, rewards are necessary in order to make the soldiers see the advantage of beating the enemy. Thus, when you capture spoils from the enemy, they must be used as rewards, so that all your men may have a keen desire to fight, each on his own account. 17. Therefore in chariot fighting, when ten or more chariots have been taken, those should be rewarded who took the first. Our own flags should be substituted for those of the enemy, and the chariots mingled and used in conjunction with ours. The captured soldiers should be kindly treated and kept. 18. This is called using the conquered foe to augment one's own strength. 19. In war, then, let your great object be victory, not lengthy campaigns. As Ho Shi remarks, war is not a thing to be trifled with. Sun Tzu here reiterates the main lesson which this chapter is intended to enforce. 20. Thus it may be known that the leader of armies is the arbiter of the people's fate, the man on whom it depends whether the nation shall be in peace or in peril. Chapter 3. Attack by Stratagem 1. Sun Tzu said, In the practical art of war, the best thing of all is to take the enemy's country whole and intact. To shatter and destroy it is not so good. So, too, 
it is better to capture an army entire than to destroy it to capture a regiment a detachment or a company entire than to destroy them the equivalent to an army corps according to su Maya Fe, consisted nominally of twelve thousand five hundred men according to tiaseo kung the equivalent of a regiment contained five hundred men the equivalent to a detachment consists from any number between one hundred and five hundred and the equivalent of a company contains from five to one hundred men for the last two however cha yu gives the exact figures of one hundred and five respectively two hence to fight and conquer in all your battles is not supreme excellence supreme excellence consists in breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting here again no modern strategist but will approve the words of the old chinese general malka's greatest triumph the capitulation of the huge french army at sedan was won practically without bloodshed three thus the highest form of generalship is to balk the enemy's plans perhaps the word balk falls short of expressing the full force of the chinese word which implies not an attitude of defense whereby one might be content to foil the enemy's stratagems one after another but an active policy of counter-attack ho she puts this very clearly in his note when the enemy has made a plan of attack against us we must anticipate him by delivering our own attack first the next best is to prevent the junction of the enemy's forces isolating him from his allies we must not forget that sun tzu in speaking of hostilities always has in mind the numerous states or principalities into which the china of his day was split up the next in order is to attack the enemy's army in the field when he is already at full strength and the worst policy of all is to besiege walled cities for the rule is not to besiege walled cities if it can possibly be avoided another sound piece of military theory had the boers acted upon it in eighteen ninety nine and refrain from dissipating their strength before Kimberley, Mafeking, or even Ladysmith, it is more than probable that they would have been masters of the situation before the British were ready seriously to oppose them. The preparation of mantlets, movable shelters, and various implements of war will take up three whole months. It is not quite clear what the Chinese word, here translated as mantlets, described. Tiaseo Kung simply defines them as large shields but we get a better idea of them from Li Siechuan, who says they were to protect the heads of those who were assaulting the city walls at close quarters. This seems to suggest a sort of Roman testudo, ready-made. Tumu says they were wheeled vehicles used in repelling attacks, but this is denied by C.H.N. Hao. See Supra 2. 14. The name is also applied to turrets on city walls. Of the movable shelters, we get a fairly clear description from several commentators. There were wooden missile-proof structures on four wheels, propelled from within, covered over with raw hides, and used in sieges to convey parties of men to and from the walls for the purpose of filling up the encircling moat with earth. Tumu adds that they are now called wooden donkeys, and the piling up of mounds over against the walls will take three months more. These were great mounds or ramparts of earth heaped up to the level of the enemy's walls in order to discover the weak points in the defense, and also to destroy the fortified turrets mentioned in the preceding note. 5. The general, unable to control his irritation, will launch his men to the assault like swarming ants. This vivid simile of Tiaseo Kung is taken from the spectacle of an army of ants climbing a wall. The meaning is that the general, losing patience at the long delay, may make a premature attempt to storm the place before his engines of war are ready with the result that one-third of his men are slain while the town still remains untaken such are the disastrous effects of a siege we are reminded of the terrible losses of the japanese before port arthur in the most recent siege which history has to record six therefore the skilful leader subdues the enemy's troops without any fighting he captures their cities without laying siege to them. He overthrows their kingdom without lengthy operations in the field. Chia Lin notes that he only overthrows the government, but does no harm to individuals. The classical instance is Wu Wang, who after having put an end to the Yin dynasty was acclaimed, Father and Mother of the People. 7. With his forces intact he will dispute the mastery of the empire, and thus, 
without losing a man his triumph will be complete owing to the double meanings in the chinese text the latter part of the sentence is susceptible of quite a different meaning and thus the weapon not being blunted by use its keenness remains perfect this is the method of attacking by stratagem eight it is the rule in war if our forces are ten to the enemy's one to surround him if five to one to attack him straightway without waiting for any further advantage if twice as numerous to divide our army into two tumu takes exception to the saying and at first sight indeed it appears to violate a fundamental principle of war tsao kung however gives a clue to sun tzu's meaning being two to the enemy's one we may use one part of our army in the regular way and the other for some special diversion chan yu thus further elucidates the point if our force is twice as numerous as that of the enemy it should be split up into two divisions one to meet the enemy in front and one to fall upon his rear if he replies to the frontal attack he may be crushed from behind if to the rearward attack he may be crushed in front this is what is meant by saying that one part may be used in the regular way and the other for some special diversion tumu does not understand that dividing one's army is simply an irregular just as concentrating it is the regular strategical method and he is too hasty in calling this a mistake nine if equally matched we can offer battle li Xiechuan, followed by ho shi gives the following paraphrase if attackers and attacked are equally matched in strength only the able general will fight if slightly inferior in numbers we can avoid the enemy the meaning we can watch the enemy is certainly a great improvement on the above but unfortunately there appears to be no very good authority for the variant cha yu reminds us that the saying only applies if the other factors are equal a small difference in numbers is often more than counterbalanced by superior energy and discipline if quite unequal in every way we can flee from him Ten. Hence, though an obstinate fight may be made by a small force, in the end it must be captured by the larger force. 11. Now the general is the bulwark of the state. If the bulwark is complete at all points, the state will be strong. If the bulwark is defective, the state will be weak. As Li Xiechuan tersely puts it, gap indicates deficiency. If the general's ability is not perfect, i.e. if he is not thoroughly versed in his profession, his army will lack strength. 12. There are three ways in which a ruler can bring misfortune upon his army. 13. One by commanding the army to advance or to retreat, being ignorant of the fact that it cannot obey. This is called hobbling the army. Li Xiechuan adds the comment. It is like tying together the legs of a thoroughbred, so that it is unable to gallop. One would naturally think of the ruler in this passage as being at home and trying to direct the movements of his army from a distance but the commentators understand just the reverse and quote the saying of tai kum a kingdom should not be governed from without an army should not be directed from within of course it is true that during an engagement or when in close touch with the enemy the general should not be in the thick of his own troops but a little distance apart otherwise he will be liable to misjudge the position as a whole and give wrong orders 14. Two by attempting to govern an army in the same way as he administers a kingdom, being ignorant of the conditions which obtain in an army. This causes restlessness in the soldiers' minds. Tseo Kung's note is, freely translated, The military sphere and the civil sphere are wholly distinct. You can't handle an army in kid gloves. And Chang Yu says, Humanity and justice are the principles on which to govern a state, but not an army opportunism and flexibility on the other hand are military rather than civil virtues to assimilate the governing of an army to that of a state understood fifteen three by employing the officers of his army without discrimination that is he is not careful to use the right man in the right place through ignorance of the military principle of adaptation to circumstances this shakes the confidence of the soldiers I follow Mei Yao Chen here. The other commentators refer not to the ruler, as in 13, 14, but to the officers he employs. Thus to you says, If a general is ignorant of the principle of adaptability, 
he must not be entrusted with a position of authority. Two Mu quotes. The skillful employer of men will employ the wise man, the brave man, the covetous man, and the stupid man. For the wise man delights in establishing his merit, the brave man likes to show his courage in action, the covetous man is quick at seizing advantages, and the stupid man has no fear of death. 16. But when the army is restless and distrustful, trouble is sure to come from the other feudal princes. This is simply bringing anarchy into the army, and flinging victory away. 17. Thus we may know that there are five essentials for victory. One he will win who knows when to fight and when not to fight. Chan Yu says, If he can fight, he advances and takes the offensive. If he cannot fight, he retreats and remains on the defensive. He will invariably conquer who knows whether it is right to take the offensive or the defensive. Two, he will win who knows how to handle both superior and inferior forces. This is not merely the general's ability to estimate numbers correctly, as Li Xiechuan and others make out. Chan Yu expounds the saying more satisfactorily. By applying the art of war, it is possible with a lesser force to defeat a greater, and vice versa. The secret lies in an eye for locality, and in not letting the right moment slip. Thus Wu Tzu says, with a superior force, make for easy ground. With an inferior one, make for difficult ground. 3. He will win whose army is animated by the same spirit throughout all its ranks. 4. He will win who, prepared himself, waits to take the enemy unprepared. 5. He will win who has military capacity and is not interfered with by the sovereign. 2. You quotes Wang Tzu as saying, It is the sovereign's function to give broad instructions but to decide on battle it is the function of the general. It is needless to dilate on the military disasters which have been caused by undue interference with operations in the field on the part of the home government. Napoleon undoubtedly owed much of his extraordinary success to the fact that he was not hampered by central authority. Victory lies in the knowledge of these five points. Literally, these five things are knowledge of the principle of victory. 18. Hence the saying, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained you will also suffer a defeat. Li Xiechuan cites the case of Fu Qian, Prince of Qin, who in 383 AD marched with a vast army against the Qin Emperor. When warned not to despise an enemy who could command the services of such men as Xian and Huan Xiechun, he boastfully replied, I have the population of eight provinces at my back, infantry and horsemen to the number of one million. Why, they could dam up the Yangtze River itself by merely throwing their whips into the stream. What danger have I to fear? Nevertheless, his forces were soon after disastrously routed at the Fei River, and he was obliged to beat a hasty retreat. If you know either the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Chang Yu said, Knowing the enemy enables you to take the offensive, knowing yourself enables you to stand on the defensive. He adds, Attack is the secret of defense. Defense is the planning of an attack. It would be hard to find a better epitome of the root principle of war. Chapter 4. Tactical Dispositions Tiaseo Kung explains the Chinese meaning of the words for the title of this chapter. Marching and countermarching on the part of the two armies with a view to discovering each other's condition. Tumu says, It is through the dispositions of an army that its condition may be discovered. Conceal your dispositions, and your condition will remain secret, which leads to victory. Show your dispositions, and your condition will become patent, which leads to defeat. Wang Shi remarks that the good general can secure success by modifying his tactics to meet those of the enemy. 1. Sun Tzu said the good fighters of old first put themselves beyond the possibility of defeat, and then waited for an opportunity of defeating the enemy. 2. To secure ourselves against defeat lies in our own hands, but the opportunity of defeating the enemy is provided by the enemy himself. That is, of course, by a mistake on the enemy's part. 3. Thus the good fighter is able to secure himself against defeat. Chan Yu says this is done. By concealing the disposition of his troops, covering up his tracks, and taking unremitting precautions. But cannot make certain of defeating the enemy. 
for hence the saying one may know how to conquer without being able to do it five security against defeat implies defensive tactics ability to defeat the enemy means taking the offensive i retain the sense found in a similar passage in one three in spite of the fact that the commentators are all against me the meaning they give he who cannot conquer takes the defensive is plausible enough six standing on the defensive indicates insufficient strength attacking a superabundance of strength seven the general who is skilled in defense hides in the most secret recesses of the earth literally hides under the ninth earth which is a metaphor indicating the utmost secrecy and concealment so that the enemy may not know his whereabouts he who is skilled in attack flashes forth from the topmost heights of heaven another metaphor implying that he falls on his adversary like a thunderbolt against which there is no time to prepare this is the opinion of most of the commentators thus on the one hand we have ability to protect ourselves on the other a victory that is complete eight to see victory only when it is within the ken of the common herd is not the acme of excellence as t s a o kung remarks the thing is to see the plant before it has germinated to foresee the event before the action has begun li si Chun alludes to the story of han h s i n who when about to attack the vastly superior army of chow which was strongly entrenched in the city of si Chingin, said to his officers gentlemen we are going to annihilate the enemy and shall meet again at dinner the officers hardly took his words seriously and gave a very dubious assent but han h s i n had already worked out in his mind the details of a clever stratagem whereby as he foresaw he was able to capture the city and inflict a crushing defeat on his adversary nine either is it the acme of excellence if you fight and conquer and the whole empire says well done true excellence being as tumu says to plan secretly to move surreptitiously to foil the enemy's intentions and balk his schemes so that at last the day may be won without shedding a drop of blood sun tzu reserves his approbation for things that the world's coarse thumb and finger failed to plumb ten to lift an autumn hair is no sign of great strength autumn hair is explained as the fur of a hair which is finest in autumn when it begins to grow afresh the phrase is a very common one in chinese writers to see sun and moon is no sign of sharp sight to hear the noise of thunder is no sign of a quick ear ho she gives as real instances of strength sharp sight and quick hearing wu hua who could lift a tripod weighing two hundred and fifty stone li chu who at a distance of a hundred paces could see objects no bigger than a mustard seed and Shi Kuang, a blind musician who could hear the footsteps of a mosquito. 11. What the ancients called a clever fighter is one who not only wins, but excels in winning with ease. The last half is literally one who, conquering, excels in easy conquering. Mei Yao Siegen says, He who only sees the obvious, wins his battles with difficulty. He who looks below the surface of things, wins with ease. 12. Hence his victories bring him neither reputation for wisdom nor credit for courage. Tu Mu explains this very well. Inasmuch as his victories are gained over circumstances that have not come to light, the world as large knows nothing of them, and he wins no reputation for wisdom. Inasmuch as the hostile state submits before there has been any bloodshed, he receives no credit for courage. 13. He wins his battles by making no mistakes c h n house says he plans no superfluous marches he devises no futile attacks the connection of ideas is thus explained by chan yu one who seeks to conquer by sheer strength clever though he may be at winning pitched battles is also liable on occasion to be vanquished whereas he who can look into the future and discern conditions that are not yet manifest will never make a blunder and therefore invariably win making no mistakes is what establishes the certainty of victory for it means conquering an enemy that is already defeated fourteen hence the skillful fighter puts himself into a position which makes defeat impossible and does not miss the moment for defeating the enemy a council of perfection as tu mu truly observes position 
need not be confined to the actual ground occupied by the troops. It includes all the arrangements and preparations which a wise general will make to increase the safety of his army. 15. Thus it is that in war the victorious strategist only seeks battle after the victory has been won, whereas he who is destined to defeat first fights and afterwards looks for victory. Ho Shi thus expounds the paradox. In warfare, first lay plans which will ensure victory, and then lead your army to battle. If you will not begin with stratagem but rely on brute strength alone, victory will no longer be assured. 16. The consummate leader cultivates the moral law, and strictly adheres to method and discipline. Thus it is in his power to control success. 17. In respect of military method we have, firstly, measurement, secondly, estimation of quantity, thirdly, calculation, fourthly, balancing of chances, fifthly, victory. 18. Measurement owes its existence to earth. Estimation of quantity to measurement. Calculation to estimation of quantity. Balancing of chances to calculation. And victory to balancing of chances. It is not easy to distinguish the four terms very clearly in the Chinese. The first seems to be surveying and measurement of the ground, which enable us to form an estimate of the enemy's strength and to make calculations based on the data thus obtained. We are thus led to a general weighing up, or comparison of the enemy's chances with our own. If the latter turn the scale, then victory ensues. The chief difficulty lies in third term, which in the Chinese some commentators take as a calculation of numbers, thereby making it nearly synonymous with the second term. Perhaps the second term should be thought of as a consideration of the enemy's general position or condition, while the third term is the estimate of his numerical strength. On the other hand, Tumu says, The question of relative strength having been settled, we can bring the varied resources of cunning into play. Hoshi seconds this interpretation, but weakens it. However, it points to the third term as being a calculation of numbers. 19. A victorious army opposed to a routed one is as a pound's weight placed in the scale against a single grain. Literally, a victorious army is like an eye twenty ounces weight against a shoe one twenty-fourth ounce. A routed army is a shoe weight against an eye. The point is simply the enormous advantage which a disciplined force, flushed with victory, has over one demoralized by defeat. Leg, in his note on Mencius, I, 2, 9, 2 makes the eye to be twenty-four Chinese ounces, and corrects Chu Shi's statement that it equaled twenty ounces only. But Li Xiechuan of the Tang dynasty here gives the same figure as Chu Shi. 20. The onrush of a conquering force is like the bursting of pent up waters into a chasm a thousand fathoms deep. So much for tactical dispositions. Chapter 5 Energy 1. Sun Tzu said the control of a large force is the same principle as the control of a few men, it is merely a question of dividing up their numbers. That is, cutting up the army into regiments, companies, etc., with subordinate officers in command of each. Tu Mu reminds us of Han H. Sian's famous reply to the first Han emperor, who once said to him, How large an army do you think I could lead? Not more than one hundred thousand men, your majesty. And you? asked the emperor. Oh, he answered, the more the better. Two. Fighting with a large army under your command is no wise different from fighting with a small one. It is merely a question of instituting signs and signals. 3. To ensure that your whole host may withstand the brunt of the enemy's attack and remain unshaken this is effected by maneuvers direct and indirect. We now come to one of the most interesting parts of Sun Tzu's treatise, the discussion of the Qing and the Qi. As it is by no means easy to grasp the full significance of these two terms, or to render them consistently by good English equivalents, it may be as well to tabulate some of the commentator's remarks on the subject before proceeding further. Li Xiechuan, facing the enemy is Qing, making lateral diversion is Qi. Qia Lin, in presence of the enemy, your troops should be arrayed in normal fashion, but in order to secure victory abnormal maneuvers must be employed. Mei Yao Xiechen, Qi is active, Qing is passive. Passivity means waiting for an opportunity. Activity brings the victory itself. Ho Shi. 
We must cause the enemy to regard our straightforward attack as one that is secretly designed, and vice versa. Thus Qing may also be Qi, and Qi may also be Qing. He instances the famous exploit of Han Hsin, who when marching ostensibly against Lin Xin now Chao Ai and Shenxi, suddenly threw a large force across the Yellow River in wooden tubs, utterly disconcerting his opponent. Ch Yen Han Shu, Ch 3. Here, we are told, the march on Lin Xin was Cheng, and the surprise maneuver was Qi. Chan Yu gives the following summary of opinions on the words. Military writers do not agree with regard to the meaning of Qi and Cheng. Wei Liao Tzu 4th Center BC says, Direct warfare favors frontal attacks, indirect warfare attacks from the rear. Tiaseo Kung says, Going straight out to join battle is a direct operation, appearing on the enemy's rear is an indirect maneuver. Li Wei Kung 6th and 7th Center AD says, In war, to march straight ahead is Qing, turning movements, on the other hand, are Qi. These writers simply regard Qing as Qing, and Qi as Qi. They do not note that the two are mutually interchangeable and run into each other like the two sides of a circle C infra. 11. A comment on the Tang Emperor Tai Tsung goes to the root of the matter. A Qi maneuver may be Qing. If we make the enemy look upon it as Qing, then our real attack will be Qi, and vice versa. The whole secret lies in confusing the enemy, so that he cannot fathom our real intent. To put it perhaps a little more clearly, any attack or other operation is Qing on which the enemy has had his attention fixed, whereas that is Qi, which takes him by surprise or comes from an unexpected quarter. If the enemy perceives a movement which is meant to be Qi, it immediately becomes Qing. 4. That the impact of your army may be like a grindstone dashed against an egg this is affected by the science of weak points and strong. 5. In all fighting the direct method may be used for joining battle but indirect methods will be needed in order to secure victory. Chang Yu says, Steadily develop indirect tactics, either by pounding the enemy's flanks or falling on his rear. A brilliant example of indirect tactics, which decided the fortunes of a campaign was Lord Robert's night march round the Paywar Kotal in the Second Afghan War. 1. 6. Indirect tactics, efficiently applied, are inexhaustible as heaven and earth unending as the flow of rivers and streams. Like the sun and moon, they end but to begin anew. Like the four seasons, they pass away but to return once more. Tu Yu and Chan Yu understand this of the permutations of Qi and Qing. But at present Sun Tzu is not speaking of Qing at all, unless, indeed, we suppose with Qing Yu Shin that a clause relating to it has fallen out of the text. Of course, as has already been pointed out, the two are so inextricably interwoven in all military operations that they cannot really be considered apart. Here we simply have an expression, in figurative language, of the almost infinite resource of a great leader. 7. There are not more than five musical notes, yet the combinations of these five give rise to more melodies than can ever be heard. 8. There are not more than five primary colors blue, yellow, red, white, and black, yet in combination they produce more hues than can ever be seen. 9. There are not more than five cardinal tastes sour, acrid, salt, sweet, bitter, yet combinations of them yield more flavors than can ever be tasted. 10. In battle, there are not more than two methods of attack the direct and the indirect, yet these two in combination give rise to an endless series of maneuvers. 11. The direct and the indirect lead on to each other in turn. It is like moving in a circle you never come to an end. Who can exhaust the possibilities of their combination? 12. The onset of troops is like the rush of a torrent which will even roll stones along in its course. 13. The quality of decision is like the well-timed swoop of a falcon which enables it to strike and destroy its victim. The Chinese here is tricky and a certain key word in the context that is used defies the best efforts of the translator. Tumu defines this word as the measurement or estimation of distance, but this meaning does not quite fit the illustrative simile in. 15. Applying this definition to the falcon, it seems to me to denote that instinct of self-restraint which keeps the bird from swooping on its quarry until the right moment, together with the power of judging when the right moment has arrived. 
The analogous quality in soldiers is the highly important one of being able to reserve their fire until the very instant at which it will be most effective. When the victory went into action at Trafalgar at hardly more than drifting pace, she was for several minutes exposed to a storm of shot and shell before replying with a single gun. Nelson coolly waited until he was within close range, when the broadside he brought to bear worked fearful havoc on the enemy's nearest ships. 14. Therefore the good fighter will be terrible in his onset, and prompt in his decision. The word, decision, would have reference to the measurement of distance mentioned above, letting the enemy get near before striking. But I cannot help thinking that Sun Tzu meant to use the word in a figurative sense comparable to our own idiom. Short and sharp. C.F. Wang Shi's note, which after describing the falcon's mode of attack, proceeds. This is just how the psychological moment should be seized in war. 15. Energy may be likened to the bending of a crossbow, decision, to the releasing of the trigger. None of the commentators seem to grasp the real point of the simile of energy, and the force stored up in the bent crossbow until released by the finger on the trigger. 16. Amid the turmoil and tumult of battle, there may be seeming disorder, and yet no real disorder at all. Amid confusion and chaos, your array may be without head or tail, yet it will be proof against defeat. May Yao Siegen says, The subdivisions of the army having been previously fixed, and the various signals agreed upon, the separating and joining, the dispersing and collecting which will take place in the course of a battle, may give the appearance of disorder when no real disorder is possible. Your formation may be without head or tail, your dispositions all topsy-turvy, and yet a rout of your force is quite out of the question. 17. Simulated disorder postulates perfect discipline. Simulated fear postulates courage. Simulated weakness postulates strength. In order to make the translation intelligible, it is necessary to tone down the sharply paradoxical form of the original. Tseo Kung throws out a hint of the meaning in his brief note. These things all serve to destroy formation and conceal one's condition. But Tu Mu is the first to put it quite plainly. If you wish to feign confusion in order to lure the enemy on, you must first have perfect discipline. If you wish to display timidity in order to entrap the enemy, you must have extreme courage. If you wish to parade your weakness in order to make the enemy overconfident, you must have exceeding strength. 18. Hiding order beneath the cloak of disorder is simply a question of subdivision. See Supra 1. Concealing courage under a show of timidity presupposes a fund of latent energy. The commentators strongly understand a certain Chinese word here differently than anywhere else in this chapter. Thus Tumu says, Seeing that we are favorably circumstanced, and yet make no move, the enemy will believe that we are really afraid. Masking strength with weakness is to be effected by tactical dispositions. Chan Yu relates the following anecdote of Kao Tzu, the first Han emperor. Wishing to crush the Sung Nu, he sent out spies to report on their condition. But the Sung Nu, forewarned, carefully concealed all their able-bodied men and well-fed horses, and only allowed infirm soldiers and emaciated cattle to be seen. The result was that spies one and all recommended the emperor to deliver his attack. Lu Qing alone opposed them, saying, When two countries go to war, they are naturally inclined to make an ostentatious display of their strength. Yet our spies have seen nothing but old age and infirmity. This is surely some ruse on the part of the enemy, and it would be unwise for us to attack. The emperor, however, disregarding this advice, fell into the trap and found himself surrounded at Patang. 19. Thus one who is skillful at keeping the enemy on the move maintains deceitful appearances, according to which the enemy will act. Tiaseo Kung's note is, Make a display of weakness and want. Tumu says, If our force happens to be superior to the enemy's, weakness may be simulated in order to lure him on. But if inferior, he must be led to believe that we are strong, in order that he may keep off. In fact, all the enemy's movements should be determined by the signs that we choose to give him. Note the following anecdote of Sun Pin, a descendant of Sun Wu, in 341 BC, the Qi state being at war with Wei, sent Tian Qi and Sun Pin against the general Pang Chuan, who happened to be a deadly personal enemy of the later. Sun Pin said, The Qi state has a reputation for cowardice, 
and therefore our adversary despises us. Let us turn this circumstance to account. Accordingly, when the army had crossed the bordering to Wei territory, he gave orders to show one hundred thousand fires on the first night, fifty thousand on the next, and the night after only twenty thousand. Pang Chuan pursued them hotly, saying to himself, I knew these men of Qi were cowards, their numbers have already fallen away by more than half. In his retreat, Sun Pin came to a narrow defile, which he calculated that his pursuers would reach after dark. Here he had a tree stripped of its bark, and inscribed upon it the words, Under this tree shall Pang Chuan die. Then, as night began to fall, he placed a strong body of archers in ambush nearby, with orders to shoot directly if they saw a light. Later on, Pang Chuan arrived at the spot, and noticing the tree, struck a light in order to read what was written on it. His body was immediately riddled by a volley of arrows, and his whole army thrown into confusion. The above is Tu Mu's version of the story. The Shi Qi, less dramatically but probably with more historical truth, makes Pang Chuan cut his own throat with an exclamation of despair, after the rout of his army. He sacrifices something, that the enemy may snatch at it. 20. By holding out baits, he keeps him on the march. Then with a body of picked men he lies in wait for him. With an emendation suggested by Li Qing, this then reads, He lies in wait with the main body of his troops. 21. The clever combatant looks to the effect of combined energy, and does not require too much from individuals. Tumu says, He first of all considers the power of his army in the bulk. Afterwards he takes individual talent into account, and uses each man according to his capabilities. He does not demand perfection from the untalented. Hence his ability to pick out the right men and utilize combined energy. 22. When he utilizes combined energy, his fighting men become as it were like unto rolling logs or stones. For it is the nature of a log or stone to remain motionless on level ground, and to move when on a slope, if four-cornered, to come to a standstill, but if round-shaped, to go rolling down. T.S.O. Kung calls this the use of natural or inherent power. 23. Thus the energy developed by good fighting men is as the momentum of a round stone rolled down a mountain thousands of feet in height. So much on the subject of energy. The chief lesson of this chapter, in Tu Mu's opinion, is the paramount importance in war of rapid evolutions and sudden rushes. Great results, he adds, can thus be achieved with small forces. 1. 41 Years in India Chapter 46 Chapter 6 Weak Points and Strong Chang Yu attempts to explain the sequence of chapters as follows. Chapter 4 On Tactical Dispositions, Treated of the Offensive and the Defensive. Chapter 5 On Energy, Dealt with Direct and Indirect Methods. The good general acquaints himself first with the theory of attack and defense and then turns his attention to direct and indirect methods. He studies the art of varying and combining these two methods before proceeding to the subject of weak and strong points. For the use of direct or indirect methods arises out of attack and defense, and the perception of weak and strong points depends again on the above methods. Hence the present chapter comes immediately after the chapter on energy. 1. Sun Tzu said, Whoever is first in the field and awaits the coming of the enemy, will be fresh for the fight. Whoever is second in the field and has to hasten to battle, will arrive exhausted. 2. Therefore the clever combatant imposes his will on the enemy, but does not allow the enemy's will to be imposed on him. One mark of a great soldier is that he fight on his own terms or fights not at all. 1. 3. By holding out advantages to him, he can cause the enemy to approach of his own accord or, by inflicting damage, he can make it impossible for the enemy to draw near. In the first case, he will entice him with a bait, in the second, he will strike at some important point which the enemy will have to defend. 4. If the enemy is taking his ease, he can harass him. This passage may be cited as evidence against Mei Yao Chen's interpretation of I. 23. If well supplied with food, he can starve him out. If quietly encamped, he can force him to move. 5. 
appear at points which the enemy must hasten to defend march swiftly to places where you are not expected six an army may march great distances without distress if it marches through country where the enemy is not t sail kung sums up very well emerge from the void qd like a bolt from the blue strike at vulnerable points shun places that are defended attack in unexpected quarters seven you can be sure of succeeding in your attacks if you only attack places which are undefended Wang she explains undefended places as weak points that is to say where the general is lacking in capacity or the soldiers in spirit where the walls are not strong enough or the precautions not strict enough where relief comes too late or provisions are too scanty or the defenders are variants amongst themselves you can ensure the safety of your defense if you only hold positions that cannot be attacked i e where there are none of the weak points mentioned above there is rather a nice point involved in the interpretation of this later clause tu mu chn hao and may yao chn assume the meaning to be in order to make your defense quite safe you must defend even those places that are not likely to be attacked and tu mu adds how much more than those that will be attacked taken thus however the clause balances less well with the preceding always a consideration in the highly antithetical style which is natural to the chinese chan yu therefore seems to come nearer the mark in saying he who is skilled in attack flashes forth from the topmost heights of heaven c4 seven making it impossible for the enemy to guard against him this being so the places that i shall attack are precisely those that the enemy cannot defend he who is skilled in defence hides in the most secret recesses of the earth making it impossible for the enemy to estimate his whereabouts this being so the places that i shall hold are precisely those that the enemy cannot attack eight hence that general is skilful in attack whose opponent does not know what to defend and he is skilful in defence whose opponent does not know what to attack an aphorism which puts the whole art of war in a nutshell nine o divine art of subtlety and secrecy through you we learn to be invisible through you inaudible literally without form or sound but it is said of course with reference to the enemy and hence we can hold the enemy's fate in our hands ten you may advance and be absolutely irresistible if you make for the enemy's weak points you may retire and be safe from pursuit if your movements are more rapid than those of the enemy eleven if we wish to fight the enemy can be forced to an engagement even though he be sheltered behind a high rampart and a deep ditch all we need do is attack some other place that he will be obliged to relieve tumu says if the enemy is the invading party we can cut his line of communications and occupy the roads by which he will have to return if we are the invaders we may direct our attack against the sovereign himself it is clear that sun tzu unlike certain generals in the late boer war was no believer in frontal attacks twelve if we do not wish to fight we can prevent the enemy from engaging us even though the lines of our encampment be merely traced out on the ground all we need do is to throw something odd and unaccountable in his way this extremely concise expression is intelligibly paraphrased by chia lin even though we have constructed neither wall nor ditch li si Yun says we puzzle him by strange and unusual dispositions and two mu finally clinches the meaning by three illustrative anecdotes one of chu keo liang who when occupying young pieng and about to be attacked by su ma ai suddenly struck his colors stopped the beating of the drums and flung open the city gates showing only a few men engaged in sweeping and sprinkling the ground this unexpected proceeding had the intended effect for su ma ai suspecting an ambush actually drew off his army and retreated what sun tzu is advocating here therefore is nothing more nor less than the timely use of bluff thirteen by discovering the enemy's dispositions and remaining invisible ourselves we can keep our forces concentrated while the enemies must be divided the conclusion is perhaps not very obvious but chan yu after mei yao chn rightly explains it thus if the enemy's dispositions are visible we can make for him in one body whereas our own dispositions being kept secret the enemy will be obliged to divide his forces in order to guard against attack from every quarter 
14. We can form a single united body, while the enemy must split up into fractions. Hence there will be a whole pitted against separate parts of a whole, which means that we shall be many to the enemy's few. 15. And if we are able thus to attack an inferior force with a superior one, our opponents will be in dire straits. 16. The spot where we intend to fight must not be made known, for then the enemy will have to prepare against a possible attack at several different points. Sheridan once explained the reason of General Grant's victories by saying that, while his opponents were kept fully employed wondering what he was going to do, he was thinking most of what he was going to do himself and his forces being thus distributed in many directions, the numbers we shall have to face at any given point will be proportionately few. 17. For should the enemy strengthen his van, he will weaken his rear. Should he strengthen his rear, he will weaken his van. Should he strengthen his left, he will weaken his right. Should he strengthen his right, he will weaken his left. If he sends reinforcements everywhere, he will everywhere be weak. In Frederick the Great's instructions to his generals we read, A defensive war is apt to betray us into too frequent detachment. Those generals who have had but little experience attempt to protect every point, while those who are better acquainted with their profession, having only the capital object in view, guard against a decisive blow, and acquiesce in small misfortunes to avoid greater. 18. Numerical weakness comes from having to prepare against possible attacks. Numerical strength from compelling our adversary to make these preparations against us. The highest generalship, in Colonel Henderson's words, is to compel the enemy to disperse his army, and then to concentrate superior force against each fraction in turn. 19. Knowing the place and the time of the coming battle, we may concentrate from the greatest distances in order to fight. What Sun Tzu evidently has in mind is that nice calculation of distances and that masterly employment of strategy which enable a general to divide his army for the purpose of a long and rapid march, and afterwards to effect a junction at precisely the right spot and the right hour in order to confront the enemy in overwhelming strength. Among many such successful junctions which military history records, one of the most dramatic and decisive was the appearance of Blucher just at the critical moment on the field of Waterloo. 20. But if either time nor place be known, then the left wing will be impotent to succor the right, the right equally impotent to succor the left, the van unable to relieve the rear, or the rear to support the van. How much more so if the furthest portions of the army are anything under a hundred li apart, and even the nearest are separated by several li. The Chinese of this last sentence is a little lacking in precision but the mental picture we are required to draw is probably that of an army advancing towards a given rendezvous in separate columns, each of which has orders to be there on a fixed date. If the general allows the various detachments to proceed at haphazard, without precise instructions as to the time and place of meeting, the enemy will be able to annihilate the army in detail. Chan Yu's note may be worth quoting here. If we do not know the place where our opponents mean to concentrate or the day on which they will join battle, our unity will be forfeited through our preparations for defense, and the positions we hold will be insecure. Suddenly happening upon a powerful foe, we shall be brought to battle in a flurried condition, and no mutual support will be possible between wings, vanguard or rear, especially if there is any great distance between the foremost and hindmost divisions of the army. 21. Though according to my estimate the soldiers of you exceed our own in number, that shall advantage them nothing in the matter of victory. I say then that victory can be achieved. Alas for these brave words. The long feud between the two states ended in 473 BC with the total defeat of Wu by Ko Qian and its incorporation in Yu. This was doubtless long after Sun Tzu's death. With his present assertion compare for. For, Chan Yu is the only one to point out the seeming discrepancy, which he thus goes on to explain. In the chapter on tactical dispositions it is said one may know how to conquer without being able to do it, whereas here we have the statement that victory can be achieved. The explanation is that in the former chapter, where the offensive and defensive are under discussion, it is said that if the enemy is fully prepared, one cannot make certain of beating him. But the present passage refers particularly to the soldiers of Yu who, according to Sun Tzu's calculations, will be kept in ignorance of the time and place of the impending struggle. 
That is why he says here that victory can be achieved. 22. Though the enemy be stronger in numbers, we may prevent him from fighting. Schemes so as to discover his plans and the likelihood of their success. An alternative reading offered by Chia Lin is, Know beforehand all plans conducive to our success and to the enemy's failure. 23. Rouse him and learn the principle of his activity or inactivity. Chan Yu tells us that by noting the joy or anger shown by the enemy on being thus disturbed, we shall be able to conclude whether his policy is to lie low or the reverse. He instances the action of Cho Ku Liang, who sent the scornful present of a woman's head dress to Su Ma Ai, in order to goad him out of his Fabian tactics. Force him to reveal himself, so as to find out his vulnerable spots. 24. Carefully compare the opposing army with your own, so that you may know where strength is superabundant and where it is deficient. CF 4. 6. 25. In making tactical dispositions, the highest pitch you can attain is to conceal them. The piquancy of the paradox evaporates in translation. Concealment is perhaps not so much actual invisibility see super 9 as showing no sign of what you mean to do, of the plans that are formed in your brain. Conceal your dispositions, and you will be safe from the prying of the subtlest spies, from the machinations of the wisest brains. Tu Mu explains, Though the enemy may have clever and capable officers, they will not be able to lay any plans against us. 26. How victory may be produced for them out of the enemy's own tactics that is what the multitude cannot comprehend. 27. All men can see the tactics whereby I conquer, but what none can see is the strategy out of which victory is evolved. I.e., everybody can see superficially how a battle is won. What they cannot see is the long series of plans and combinations which has preceded the battle. 28. Do not repeat the tactics which have gained you one victory, but let your methods be regulated by the infinite variety of circumstances. As one she sagely remarks, there is but one root principle underlying victory, but the tactics which lead up to it are infinite in number. With this compare Colonel Henderson. The rules of strategy are few and simple. They may be learned in a week. They may be taught by familiar illustrations or a dozen diagrams. But such knowledge will no more teach a man to lead an army like Napoleon than a knowledge of grammar will teach him to write like Gibbon. 29. Military tactics are like unto water for water in its natural course runs away from high places and hastens downwards. 30. So in war, the way is to avoid what is strong and to strike at what is weak. Like water, taking the line of least resistance. 31. Water shapes its course according to the nature of the ground over which it flows. The soldier works out his victory in relation to the foe whom he is facing. 32. Therefore, just as water retains no constant shape, so in warfare there are no constant conditions. 33. He who can modify his tactics in relation to his opponent, and thereby succeed in winning, may be called a heaven-born captain. 34. The five elements water, fire, wood, metal, earth are not always equally predominant. That is, as one she says, they predominate alternately. The four seasons make way for each other in turn. Literally, have no invariable seat. There are short days and long. The moon has its periods of waning and waxing. CFV 6. The purport of the passage is simply to illustrate the want of fixity in war by the changes constantly taking place in nature. The comparison is not very happy, however, because the regularity of the phenomena which Sun Tzu mentions is by no means paralleled in war. 1. See Colonel Henderson's Biography of Stonewall Jackson, 1902 edition, volume 2, page 490. Chapter 7. Maneuvering. 1. Sun Tzu said, in war, the general receives his commands from the sovereign. 2. Having collected an army and concentrated his forces, he must blend and harmonize the different elements thereof before pitching his camp. Chang Yu says, the establishment of harmony and confidence between the higher and lower ranks before venturing into the field. And he quotes a saying of Wu Tzu chapter 1 at in it, Without harmony in the state, 
no military expedition can be undertaken. Without harmony in the army, no battle array can be formed. In an historical romance Sun Tzu is represented as saying to Wu Yuan, As a general rule, those who are waging war should get rid of all the domestic troubles before proceeding to attack the external foe. 3. After that comes tactical maneuvering, than which there is nothing more difficult. I have departed slightly from the traditional interpretation of Tiaseo Kung, who says, From the time of receiving the sovereign's instructions until our encampment over against the enemy, the tactics to be pursued are most difficult. It seems to me that the tactics or maneuvers can hardly be said to begin until the army has sallied forth and encamped, and Chien Hao's note gives color to this view. For levying, concentrating, harmonizing and entrenching an army, there are plenty of old rules which will serve. The real difficulty comes when we engage in tactical operations. Tu Yu also observes that. The great difficulty is to be beforehand with the enemy in seizing favorable position. The difficulty of tactical maneuvering consists in turning the devious into the direct, and misfortune into gain. This sentence contains one of those highly condensed and somewhat enigmatical expressions of which Sun Tzu is so fond. This is how it is explained by Tiaseo Kum. Make it appear that you are a long way off, then cover the distance rapidly and arrive on the scene before your opponent. Tumu says, Hoodwink the enemy, so that he may be remiss and leisurely while you are dashing along with utmost speed. Hoshi gives a slightly different turn. Although you may have difficult ground to traverse and natural obstacles to encounter this is a drawback which can be turned into actual advantage by celerity of movement. Signal examples of this saying are afforded by the two famous passages across the Alps that of Hannibal, which laid Italy at his mercy, and that of Napoleon two thousand years later, which resulted in the great victory of Marengo. 4. Thus, to take a long and circuitous route, after enticing the enemy out of the way, and though starting after him, to contrive to reach the goal before him, shows knowledge of the artifice of deviation. Tumu cites the famous march of Chao Shi in 270 BC to relieve the town of Oyu, which was closely invested by a Qin army. The king of Chao first consulted Lin Pa on the advisability of attempting a relief, but the latter thought the distance too great, and the intervening country too rugged and difficult. His majesty then turned to Chao Shi, who fully admitted the hazardous nature of the march, but finally said, We shall be like two rats fighting in a hole and the pluckier one will win. So he left the capital with his army, but had only gone a distance of thirty li when he stopped and began throwing up entrenchments. For twenty-eight days he continued strengthening his fortifications, and took care that spies should carry the intelligence to the enemy. The Qin general was overjoyed, and attributed his adversary's tardiness to the fact that the beleaguered city was in the Han state, and thus not actually part of Chao territory. But the spies had no sooner departed than Chao Shi began a forced march lasting for two days and one night, and arrive on the scene of action with such astonishing rapidity that he was able to occupy a commanding position on the North Hill, before the enemy had got wind of his movements. A crushing defeat followed for the Qin forces, who were obliged to raise the siege of Ou in all haste and retreat across the border. 5. Maneuvering with an army is advantageous with an undisciplined multitude, most dangerous. I adopt the reading of the Tung Tian, Qing Yu Xin and the Tu Shu, since they appear to apply the exact nuance required in order to make sense. The commentators using the standard text take this line to mean that maneuvers may be profitable, or they may be dangerous. It all depends on the ability of the general. 6. If you set a fully equipped army in march in order to snatch an advantage, the chances are that you will be too late. On the other hand, to detach a flying column for the purpose involves the sacrifice of its baggage and stores. Some of the Chinese text is unintelligible to the Chinese commentators, who paraphrase the sentence. I submit my own rendering without much enthusiasm, being convinced that there is some deep-seated corruption in the text. On the whole, it is clear that Sun Tzu does not approve of a lengthy march being undertaken without supplies. CF Infra 11. 7. Thus, if you order your men to roll up their buff coats and make force marches without halting day or night, covering double the usual distance at a stretch. The ordinary day's march, according to Tu Mu, 
was thirty li. But on one occasion, when pursuing Lu Pei, Tiaseo Tiaseo is said to have covered the incredible distance of three hundred li within twenty-four hours. Doing a hundred li in order to rest an advantage, the leaders of all your three divisions will fall into the hands of the enemy. 8. The stronger men will be in front, the jaded ones will fall behind, and on this plan only one-tenth of your army will reach its destination. The moral is, as Tiaseo Kung and others point out, don't march a hundred li to gain a tactical advantage either with or without impedimenta. Maneuvers of this description should be confined to short distances. Stonewall Jackson said, The hardships of forced marches are often more painful than the dangers of battle. He did not often call upon his troops for extraordinary exertions. It was only when he intended a surprise, or when a rapid retreat was imperative, that he sacrificed everything for speed. 1. 9. If you march fifty li in order to outmaneuver the enemy, you will lose the leader of your first division, and only half your force will reach the goal. Literally, the leader of the first division will be torn away. 10. If you march thirty li with the same object, two thirds of your army will arrive. In the tongue, Tien is added. From this, we may know the difficulty of maneuvering. 11. We may take it then that an army without its baggage train is lost, without provisions, it is lost, without bases of supply, it is lost. I think Sun Tzu meant. Stores accumulated in depots. But Tu Yu says, Fodder and the like. Chang Yu says, Goods in general. And Wang Shi says, Fuel, salt, foodstuffs, etc. 12. We cannot enter into alliances until we are acquainted with the designs of our neighbors. 13. We are not fit to lead an army on the march unless we are familiar with the face of the country, its mountains and forests, its pitfalls and precipices its marshes and swamps. 14. We shall be unable to turn natural advantages to account unless we make use of local guides. 12.14 are repeated in Chapter 11. 52. 15. In war, practice dissimulation, and you will succeed. In the tactics of Turin, deception of the enemy, especially as to the numerical strength of his troops, took a very prominent position. 2. Move only if there is a real advantage to be gained. 16. Whether to concentrate or to divide your troops must be decided by circumstances. 17. Let your rapidity be that of the wind. The simile is doubly appropriate, because the wind is not only swift but, as May Yao Chn points out, invisible and leaves no tracks. Your compactness that of the forest. Meng Shi comes nearer to the mark in his note. When slowly marching, order and ranks must be preserved, so as to guard against surprise attacks. But natural forests do not grow in rows, whereas they do generally possess the quality of density or compactness. 18. In raiding and plundering be like fire. Cf. Shi Ching 4. 3. 4. 6. Fierce as a blazing fire which no man can check in immovability like a mountain. That is, when holding a position from which the enemy is trying to dislodge you, or perhaps, as to you says, when he is trying to entice you into a trap. 19. Let your plans be dark and impenetrable as night, and when you move, fall like a thunderbolt. To you quotes a saying of Tai Kung which has passed into a proverb. You cannot shut your ears to the thunder or your eyes to the lighting so rapid are they. Likewise, an attack should be made so quickly that it cannot be parried. 20. When you plunder a countryside, let the spoil be divided amongst your men. Sun Tzu wishes to lessen the abuses of indiscriminate plundering by insisting that all booty shall be thrown into a common stock, which may afterwards be fairly divided amongst all. When you capture new territory, cut it up into allotments for the benefit of the soldiery. CHN House says, Quarter your soldiers on the land, and let them sow and plant it. It is by acting on this principle, and harvesting the lands they invaded, that the Chinese have succeeded in carrying out some of their most memorable and triumphant expeditions, such as that of Pan Si Chao who penetrated to the Caspian, and in more recent years, those of Fu Keongin and So Tsung Tang. 21. Ponder and deliberate before you make a move. 
Chan Yu quotes Wei Liao Tzu as saying that we must not break camp until we have gained the resisting power of the enemy and the cleverness of the opposing general. CF the seven comparisons, in I, 13. 22. He will conquer who has learnt the artifice of deviation. See Supra 3, 4. Such is the art of maneuvering. With these words, the chapter would naturally come to an end. But there now follows a long appendix in the shape of an extract from an earlier book on war, now lost, but apparently extant at the time when Sun Tzu wrote. The style of this fragment is not noticeably different from that of Sun Tzu himself, but no commentator raises a doubt as to its genuineness. 23. The Book of Army Management says, It is perhaps significant that none of the earlier commentators give us any information about this work. Mei Yao Chen calls it an ancient military classic, and Wang Shi, an old book on war. Considering the enormous amount of fighting that had gone on for centuries before Sun Tzu's time between the various kingdoms and principalities of China, it is not in itself improbable that a collection of military maxims should have been made and written down at some earlier period. On the field of battle Implied, though not actually in the Chinese, the spoken word does not carry far enough hence the institution of gongs and drums. Nor can ordinary objects be seen clearly enough, hence the institution of banners and flags. 24. Gongs and drums, banners and flags, are means whereby the ears and eyes of the host may be focused on one particular point. Chang Yu says, If sight and hearing converge simultaneously on the same object, the evolutions of as many as a million soldiers will be like those of a single man. 25. The host thus forming a single united body, is it impossible either for the brave to advance alone, or for the cowardly to retreat alone? Chuan Yu quotes a saying, Equally guilty are those who advance against orders and those who retreat against orders. Tu Mu tells a story in this connection of Wu Qi, when he was fighting against the Qin state. Before the battle had begun, one of his soldiers, a man of matchless daring, sallied forth by himself captured two heads from the enemy, and returned to camp. Wu Qi had the man instantly executed, whereupon an officer ventured to remonstrate, saying, This man was a good soldier, and ought not to have been beheaded. Wu Qi replied, I fully believe he was a good soldier, but I had him beheaded because he acted without orders. This is the art of handling large masses of men. 26. In night fighting, then, make much use of signal fires and drums, and in fighting by day, of flags and banners, as a means of influencing the ears and eyes of your army. C.H.N. Hao alludes to Li Kuang Pai's night ride to Ho Yang at the head of five hundred mounted men. They made such an imposing display with torches, that though the rebel leader Shi Su Ming had a large army, he did not dare to dispute their passage. 27. A whole army may be robbed of its spirit. In war, says Chan Yu, if a spirit of anger can be made to pervade all ranks of an army at one and the same time, its onset will be irresistible. Now the spirit of the enemy's soldiers will be keenest when they have newly arrived on the scene, and it is therefore our cue not to fight at once, but to wait until their ardor and enthusiasm have worn off, and then strike. It is in this way that they may be robbed of their keen spirit. Li Xiechuan and others tell an anecdote to be found in the Tso Chuan, Year 10, one of TSAOK, a protege of Duke Chuang of Lu. The latter state was attacked by Qi, and the Duke was about to join battle at Changchou after the first roll of the enemy's drums, when Tiaseo said, Not just yet. Only after their drums had beaten for the third time did he give the word for attack. Then they fought, and the men of Qi were utterly defeated. Questioned afterwards by the Duke as to the meaning of his delay, Tiaseo K replied, in battle, a courageous spirit is everything. Now the first roll of the drum tends to create this spirit, but with the second it is already on the wane, and after the third it is gone altogether. I attacked when their spirit was gone and ours was at its height. Hence our victory. Wu Tzu chapter 4 puts spirit first among the four important influences in war and continues. The value of a whole army a mighty host of a million men is dependent on one man alone. Such is the influence of spirit. A commander-in-chief may be robbed of his presence of mind. 
Chang Yu says. Presence of mind is the general's most important asset. It is the quality which enables him to discipline disorder and to inspire courage into the panic stricken. The great general Li Qing AD 571 649 has a saying attacking does not merely consist in assaulting walled cities or striking at an army in battle array it must include the art of assailing the enemy's mental equilibrium twenty eight now a soldier's spirit is keenest in the morning always provided i suppose that he has had breakfast at the battle of the trebia the romans were foolishly allowed to fight fasting whereas hannibal's men had breakfasted at their leisure see livy xxi live 8 lv1 and 8 by noonday it has begun to flag and in the evening his mind is bent only on returning to camp 29 a clever general therefore avoids an army when its spirit is keen but attacks it when it is sluggish and inclined to return this is the art of studying moods 30 disciplined and calm to await the appearance of disorder and hubbub amongst the enemy this is the art of retaining self-possession 31. To be near the goal while the enemy is still far from it, to wait at ease while the enemy is toiling and struggling, to be well fed while the enemy is famished, this is the art of husbanding one's strength. 32. To refrain from intercepting an enemy whose banners are in perfect order, to refrain from attacking an army drawn up in calm and confident array, this is the art of studying circumstances. 33. It is a military axiom not to advance uphill against the enemy, nor to oppose him when he comes downhill. 34. Do not pursue an enemy who simulates flight. Do not attack soldiers whose temper is keen. 35. Do not swallow a bait offered by the enemy. Li Xiechun and Tu Mu, with extraordinary inability to see a metaphor, take these words quite literally of food and drink that have been poisoned by the enemy. C.H.N. Hao and Chao Yu carefully point out that the saying has a wider application. Do not interfere with an army that is returning home. The commentators explain this rather singular piece of advice by saying that a man whose heart is set on returning home will fight to the death against any attempt to bar his way, and is therefore too dangerous an opponent to be tackled. Chan Yu quotes the words of Han H.S.I.N. Invincible is the soldier who hath his desire and returneth homewards. A marvelous tale is told of Tiaseo Tiaseo's courage and resource in Ch. One of the San Quichi. In 198 A.D., he was besieging Chang Su and Zheng when Lu Piao sent reinforcements with a view to cutting off Tiaseo's retreat. The latter was obliged to draw off his troops, only to find himself hemmed in between two enemies, who were guarding each outlet of a narrow pass in which he had engaged himself. In this desperate plight, Tiaseo waited until nightfall when he bored a tunnel into the mountain's side and laid an ambush in it. As soon as the whole army had passed by, the hidden troops fell on his rear, while Tiaseo himself turned and met his pursuers in front, so that they were thrown into confusion and annihilated. Tiaseo Tiaseo said afterwards, The brigands tried to check my army in its retreat, and brought me to battle in a desperate position. Hence I knew how to overcome them. 36. When you surround an army, leave an outlet free. This does not mean that the enemy is to be allowed to escape. The object, as Tumu puts it, is to make him believe that there is a road to safety, and thus prevent his fighting with the courage of despair. Tumu adds pleasantly, After that you may crush him. Do not press a desperate foe too hard. C.H.N. How quotes the saying, Birds and beasts when brought to bay will use their claws and teeth. Chang Yu says, if your adversary has burned his boats and destroyed his cooking pots, and is ready to stake all on the issue of a battle, he must not be pushed to extremities. Ho Shi illustrates the meaning by a story taken from the life of Yan Qing. That general, together with his colleague Tu Cheng Wei, was surrounded by a vastly superior army of chitons in the year 945 AD. The country was bare and desert like, and the little Chinese force was soon in dire straits for want of water. The wells they bored ran dry, and the men were reduced to squeezing lumps of mud and sucking out the moisture. Their ranks thinned rapidly, until at last Fu Yen Ching exclaimed, We are desperate men. Far better to die for our country than to go with fettered hands into captivity. 
a strong gale happened to be blowing from the northeast and darkening the air with dense clouds of sandy dust to chum wei was for waiting until this had abetted before deciding on a final attack but luckily another officer li Shou ching by name was quicker to see an opportunity and said they are many and we are few but in the midst of this sandstorm our numbers will not be discernible victory will go to the strenuous fighter and the wind will be our best ally accordingly fu yen ching made a sudden and wholly unexpected onslaught with his cavalry routed the barbarians and succeeded in breaking through to safety thirty seven such is the art of warfare one c colonel henderson opposite volume one page four twenty six two for a number of maxims on this head c marshal turin longmans nineteen o seven page twenty nine chapter eight variation of tactics the heading means literally the nine variations but as sun tzu does not appear to enumerate these and as indeed he has already told us v six eleven that such deflections from the ordinary course are practically innumerable we have little option but to follow wang shi who says that nine stands for an indefinitely large number all it means is that in warfare we ought to vary our tactics to the utmost degree I do not know what Tiaseo Kum makes these nine variations out to be, but it has been suggested that they are connected with the nine situations. Of Chapt. 11. This is the view adopted by Chan Yu. The only other alternative is to suppose that something has been lost, a supposition to which the unusual shortness of the chapter lends some weight. 1. Sun Tzu said, In war, the general receives his commands from the sovereign collects his army and concentrates his forces repeated from seven one where it is certainly more in place it may have been interpolated here merely in order to supply a beginning to the chapter two when in difficult country do not encamp in country where high roads intersect join hands with your allies do not linger in dangerously isolated positions the last situation is not one of the nine situations as given in the beginning of chapter 11, but occurs later on Ibid 43. QV. Chan Yu defines this situation as being situated across the frontier, in hostile territory. Li Xiechuan says it is country in which there are no springs or wells, flocks or herds, vegetables or firewood. Chia Lin. One of gorges, chasms and precipices, without a road by which to advance. In hemmed in situations, you must resort to stratagem. In a desperate position, you must fight. 3. There are roads which must not be followed. Especially those leading through narrow defile, says Li Xiechuan, where an ambush is to be feared. Armies which must be not attacked. More correctly, perhaps, there are times when an army must not be attacked. Chen Hao says, when you see your way to obtain a rival advantage, but are powerless to inflict a real defeat, refrain from attacking, for fear of overtaxing your men's strength. Towns which must not be besieged. CF3. For Tiaseo Kung gives an interesting illustration from his own experience. When invading the territory of Su Chou, he ignored the city of Hua Pai, which lay directly in his path, and pressed on into the heart of the country. This excellent strategy was rewarded by the subsequent capture of no fewer than fourteen important district cities. Chang Yu says, No town should be attacked which, if taken, cannot be held, or if left alone, will not cause any trouble. Sun Ning, when urged to attack Pai Yang, replied, The city is small and well fortified. Even if I succeed in taking it, it will be no great feat of arms, whereas if I fail, I shall make myself a laughing stock. In the 17th century, sieges still formed a large proportion of war. It was Turin who directed attention to the importance of marches, countermarches, and maneuvers. He said, It is a great mistake to waste men in taking a town when the same expenditure of soldiers will gain a province. 1. Positions which must not be contested, commands of the sovereign which must not be obeyed. This is a hard saying for the Chinese, with their reverence for authority and Wei Liao Tzu quoted by Tu Mu is moved to exclaim, Weapons are baleful instruments, strife is antagonistic to virtue, a military commander is the negation of civil order. 
the unpalatable fact remains however that even imperial wishes must be subordinated to military necessity four the general who thoroughly understands the advantages that accompany variation of tactics knows how to handle his troops five the general who does not understand these may be well acquainted with the configuration of the country yet he will not be able to turn his knowledge to practical account literally get the advantage of the ground which means not only securing good positions but availing oneself of natural advantages in every possible way chang yu says every kind of ground is characterized by certain natural features and also gives scope for a certain variability of plan how it is possible to turn these natural features to account unless topographical knowledge is supplemented by versatility of mind six so the student of war who is unversed in the art of war of varying his plans even though he be acquainted with the five advantages will fail to make the best use of his men chia lin tells us that these imply five obvious and generally advantageous lines of action namely if a certain road is short it must be followed if an army is isolated it must be attacked if a town is in a parlous condition it must be besieged if a position can be stormed it must be attempted and if consistent with military operations the ruler's commands must be obeyed but there are circumstances which sometimes forbid a general to use these advantages for instance a certain road may be the shortest way for him but if he knows that it abounds in natural obstacles or that the enemy has laid an ambush on it he will not follow that road a hostile force may be open to attack but if he knows that it is hard pressed and likely to fight with desperation he will refrain from striking and so on seven hence in the wise leader's plans considerations of advantage and of disadvantage will be blended together whether in an advantageous position or a disadvantageous one says t s a o come the opposite state should be always present to your mind eight if our expectation of advantage be tempered in this way we may succeed in accomplishing the essential part of our schemes tumu says if we wish to wrest an advantage from the enemy we must not fix our minds on that alone but allow for the possibility of the enemy also doing some harm to us and let this enter as a factor into our calculations nine if on the other hand in the midst of difficulties we are always ready to seize an advantage we may extricate ourselves from misfortune tumu says if i wish to extricate myself from a dangerous position i must consider not only the enemy's ability to injure me but also my own ability to gain an advantage over the enemy if in my counsels these two considerations are properly blended i shall succeed in liberating myself for instance if i am surrounded by the enemy and only think of effecting an escape the nervelessness of my policy will incite my adversary to pursue and crush me it would be far better to encourage my men to deliver a bold counter-attack and use the advantage thus gained to free myself from the enemy's toils see the story of tsao tsao seven thirty five note ten reduce the hostile chiefs by inflicting damage on them chia lin enumerates several ways of inflicting this injury some of which would only occur to the oriental mind entice away the enemy's best and wisest men so that he may be left without counsellors introduce traitors into his country that the government policy may be rendered futile foment intrigue and deceit and thus sow dissension between the ruler and his ministers by means of every artful contrivance cause deterioration amongst his men and waste of his treasure corrupt his morals by insidious gifts leading him into excess disturb and unsettle his mind by presenting him with lovely women chang yu after wang she makes a different interpretation of sun tzu here get the enemy into a position where he must suffer injury and he will submit of his own accord and make trouble for them tu mu in this phrase in his interpretation indicates that trouble should be made for the enemy affecting their possessions or as we might say assets which he considers to be a large army a rich exchequer harmony amongst the soldiers punctual fulfillment of commands these give us a whip hand over the enemy and keep them constantly engaged literally make servants of them to you says prevent them from having any rest hold out specious allurements 
and make them rush to any given point. Meng Shi's note contains an excellent example of the idiomatic use of cause them to forget Pian the reasons for acting otherwise than on their first impulse, and hasten in our direction. 11. The art of war teaches us to rely not on the likelihood of the enemy's not coming, but on our own readiness to receive him, not on the chance of his not attacking, but rather on the fact that we have made our position unassailable. 12. There are five dangerous faults which may affect a general, one recklessness, which leads to destruction. Bravery without forethought, as Tiaseo Kung analyzes it, which causes a man to fight blindly and desperately like a mad bull. Such an opponent, says Chan Yu, must not be encountered with brute force, but may be lured into an ambush and slain. C.F. Wu Tzu, Chapter 4. Add in it. In estimating the character of a general, men are wont to pay exclusive attention to his courage, forgetting that courage is only one out of many qualities which a general should possess. The merely brave man is prone to fight recklessly, and he who fights recklessly, without any perception of what is expedient, must be condemned. Sumaya Fei, too, makes the incisive remark. Simply going to one's death does not bring about victory. Too cowardice, which leads to capture. Tiaseo Kung defines the Chinese word translated here as cowardice, as being of the man, whom timidity prevents from advancing to seize an advantage, and one she adds, who is quick to flee at the sight of danger. Ming Shi gives the closer paraphrase. He who is bent on returning alive. This is, the man who will never take a risk. But, as Sun Tzu knew, nothing is to be achieved in war unless you are willing to take risks. Tai Kung said, He who lets an advantage slip will subsequently bring upon himself real disaster. In 404 AD, Lu Yu pursued the rebel Huan Suin up the Yangtze and fought a naval battle with him at the island of Si Ching Hung. The loyal troops numbered only a few thousands while their opponents were in great force. But Huan Suin, fearing the fate which was in store for him should be be overcome, had a light boat made fast to the side of his war junk, so that he might escape, if necessary, at a moment's notice. The natural result was that the fighting spirit of his soldiers was utterly quenched, and when the loyalists made an attack from windward with fire ships, all striving with the utmost ardor to be first in the fray, Huan Suin's forces were routed, had to burn all their baggage and fled for two days and nights without stopping. Chan Yu tells a somewhat similar story of Chao Ying Chi, a general of the Qin state who during a battle with the army of Si in 597 BC had a boat kept in readiness for him on the river, wishing in case of defeat to be the first to get across. 3. A hasty temper, which can be provoked by insults. Tumu tells us that Yao Xing, when opposed in 357 A.D. by Huang Mei, Ting Xie Chiang and others shut himself up behind his walls and refused to fight. Ting Xie Chiang said, Our adversary is of a choleric temper and easily provoked. Let us make constant sallies and break down his walls, then he will grow angry and come out. Once we can bring his force to battle, it is doomed to be our prey. This plan was acted upon. Yao Xiang came out to fight, was lured as far as San Yuan by the enemy's pretended flight, and finally attacked and slain. For a delicacy of honor which is sensitive to shame. This need not be taken to mean that a sense of honor is really a defect in a general. What Sun Tzu condemns is rather an exaggerated sensitiveness to slanderous reports, the thin-skinned man who is stung by opprobrium, however undeserved. May Yao Siichen truly observes, though somewhat paradoxically. The seeker after glory should be careless of public opinion. 5. Over solicitude for his men, which exposes him to worry and trouble. Here again, Sun Tzu does not mean that the general is to be careless of the welfare of his troops. All he wishes to emphasize is the danger of sacrificing any important military advantage to the immediate comfort of his men. This is a short-sighted policy, because in the long run the troops will suffer more from the defeat or, at best, the prolongation of the war, which will be the consequence. A mistaken feeling of pity will often induce a general to relieve a beleaguered city, or to reinforce a hard-pressed detachment, contrary to his military instincts. It is now generally admitted that our repeated efforts to relieve Ladysmith in the South African War were so many strategical blunders which defeated their own purpose. 
And in the end, relief came through the very man who started out with the distinct resolve no longer to subordinate the interests of the whole to sentiment in favor of a part. An old soldier of one of our generals who failed most conspicuously in this war, tried once, I remember, to defend him to me on the ground that he was always so good to his men. By this plea, had he but known it, he was only condemning him out of Sun Tzu's mouth. 13. These are the five besetting sins of a general, ruinous to the conduct of war. 14. When an army is overthrown and its leader slain, the cause will surely be found among these five dangerous faults. Let them be a subject of meditation. 1. Marshal Turin. Page 50. Chapter 9. The Army on the March. The contents of this interesting chapter are better indicated in one than by this heading. 1. Sun Tzu said, We come now to the question of encamping the army, and observing signs of the enemy. Pass quickly over mountains, and keep in the neighborhood of valleys. The idea is, not to linger among barren uplands, but to keep close to supplies of water and grass. Cf. Wu Tzu, ch. 3. Abide not in natural ovens, i.e. the openings of valleys. Chang Yu tells the following anecdote. Wu Tu Chiang was a robber captain in the time of the later Han, and Ma Yuan was sent to exterminate his gang. Chiang having found a refuge in the hills, Ma Yuan made no attempt to force a battle, but seized all the favorable positions commanding supplies of water and forage. Chiang was soon in such a desperate plight for want of provisions that he was forced to make a total surrender. He did not know the advantage of keeping in the neighborhood of valleys. 2. Camp in high places. Not on high hills, but on knolls or hillocks elevated above the surrounding country. Facing the sun. Tu Mu takes this to mean facing south, and Chen Hao, facing east. Cf. Infra, 11 13. Do not climb heights in order to fight. So much for mountain warfare. 3. After crossing a river, you should get far away from it. In order to tempt the enemy to cross after you, according to Tseo Kum, and also, says Chan Yu, in order not to be impeded in your evolutions, the Tung Tian reads, if the enemy crosses a river, etc. But in view of the next sentence, this is almost certainly an interpolation. 4. When an invading force crosses a river in its onward march, do not advance to meet it in midstream. It will be best to let half the army get across, and then deliver your attack. Li Xiechuan alludes to the great victory won by Han Hsian over Lung Chu at the Wei River. Turning to the Xiechian Han Shu, ch. 34, folio 6 verso, we find the battle described as follows. The two armies were drawn up on opposite sides of the river. In the night, Han Hsian ordered his men to take some ten thousand sacks filled with sand and construct a dam higher up. Then, leading half his army across, he attacked Lung Chu, but after a time, pretending to have failed in his attempt, he hastily withdrew to the other bank. Lung Chu was much elated by this unlooked for success, and exclaiming, I felt sure that Han Hsian was really a coward. He pursued him and began crossing the river in his turn. Han Hsian now sent a party to cut open the sandbags, thus releasing a great volume of water, which swept down and prevented the greater portion of Lung Chu's army from getting across. He then turned upon the force which had been cut off, and annihilated it, Lung Chu himself being amongst the slain. The rest of the army, on the further bank, also scattered and fled in all directions. 5. If you are anxious to fight, you should not go to meet the invader near a river which he has to cross, for fear of preventing his crossing. 6. Moor your craft higher up than the enemy, and facing the sun. See Supra 2. The repetition of these words in connection with water is very awkward. Chan Yu has the note. Said either of troops marshaled on the river bank, or of boats anchored in the stream itself. In either case it is essential to be higher than the enemy and facing the sun. The other commentators are not at all explicit. Do not move upstream to meet the enemy. Tumu says, As water flows downwards, we must not pitch our camp on the lower reaches of a river, for fear the enemy should open the sluices and sweep us away in a flood. 
Chu Keo Wu Ho has remarked that in river warfare we must not advance against the stream, which is as much as to say that our fleet must not be anchored below that of the enemy, for then they would be able to take advantage of the current and make short work of us. There is also the danger, noted by other commentators, that the enemy may throw poison on the water to be carried down to us. So much for river warfare. 7. In crossing salt marshes your sole concern should be to get over them quickly, without any delay. Because of the lack of fresh water, the poor quality of the herbage, and last but not least, because they are low, flat, and exposed to attack. 8. If forced to fight in a salt marsh, you should have water and grass near you, and get your back to a clump of trees. Li Xiechun remarks that the ground is less likely to be treacherous where there are trees, while Tu Mu says that they will serve to protect the rear. So much for operations in salt marshes. 9. In dry level country, take up an easily accessible position with rising ground to your right and on your rear. Tu Mu quotes Tai Kung as saying, An army should have a stream or a marsh on its left, and a hill or tumulus on its right, so that the danger may be in front and safety lie behind. So much for campaigning in flat country. 10. These are the four useful branches of military knowledge. Those, namely, concerned with one mountains, two rivers, three marshes, and four plains. Compare Napoleon's. Military maxims. Number 1. Which enabled the Yellow Emperor to vanquish for several sovereigns. Regarding the Yellow Emperor, Mei Yao Xiechen asks, with some plausibility, whether there is an error in the text as nothing is known of Huang Ti having conquered four other emperors. The Shi Qi CH1 in it speaks only of his victories over Yen Ti and Si Chai Chu. In the Lu Tao it is mentioned that he fought seventy battles and pacified the empire. Tiaseo Kung's explanation is that the Yellow Emperor was the first to institute the feudal system of vassals princes each of whom to the number of four originally bore the title of emperor. Li Xiechuan tells us that the art of war originated under Huang Ti, who received it from his minister Feng Ho. 11. All armies prefer high ground to low. High ground, says Mei Yao Xiechen, is not only more agreeable and salubrious, but more convenient from a military point of view. Low ground is not only damp and unhealthy, but also disadvantageous for fighting and sunny places to dark. 12. If you are careful of your men, Tiaseo Kung says, make for fresh water and pasture, where you can turn out your animals to graze, and camp on hard ground, the army will be free from disease of every kind. Chang Yu says, the dryness of the climate will prevent the outbreak of illness, and this will spell victory. 13. When you come to a hill or a bank, occupy the sunny side with the slope on your right rear. Thus you will at once act for the benefit of your soldiers and utilize the natural advantages of the ground. 14. When, in consequence of heavy rains up country, a river which you wish to ford is swollen and flecked with foam, you must wait until it subsides. 15. Country in which there are precipitous cliffs with torrents running between deep natural hollows. The latter defined as Places enclosed on every side by steep banks, with pools of water at the bottom. Confined places. Defined as natural pens or prisons. Or places surrounded by precipices on three sides easy to get into, but hard to get out of. Tangled thickets. Defined as places covered with such dense undergrowth that spears cannot be used. Quagmires. Defined as low-lying places, so heavy with mud as to be impassable for chariots and horsemen, and crevasses, defined by Mei Yao Chen as a narrow difficult way between beetling cliffs. Tumu's note is, ground covered with trees and rocks, and intersected by numerous ravines and pitfalls. This is very vague, but Chia Lin explains it clearly enough as a defile or narrow pass, and Chan Yu takes much the same view. On the whole, the weight of the commentator certainly inclines to the rendering. Defile. But the ordinary meaning of the Chinese in one place is a crack or fissure, and the fact that the meaning of the Chinese elsewhere in the sentence indicates something in the nature of a defile make me think that Sun Tzu is here speaking of crevasses. 
should be left with all possible speed and not approached. 16. While we keep away from such places, we should get the enemy to approach them. While we face them, we should let the enemy have them on his rear. 17. If in the neighborhood of your camp there should be any hilly country, ponds surrounded by aquatic grass, hollow basins filled with reeds, or woods with thick undergrowth, they must be carefully routed out and searched, for these are places where men in ambush or insidious spies are likely to be lurking. Chang Yu has the note. We must also be on our guard against traitors who may lie in close covert, secretly spying out our weaknesses and overhearing our instructions. 18. When the enemy is close at hand and remains quiet, he is relying on the natural strength of his position. Here begin Sun Tzu's remarks on the reading of signs, much of which is so good that it could almost be included in a modern manual like General Baden-Powell's. Aids to Scouting 19. When he keeps aloof and tries to provoke a battle, he is anxious for the other side to advance. Probably because we are in a strong position from which he wishes to dislodge us. If he came close up to us, says Tumu, and tried to force a battle, he would seem to despise us, and there would be less probability of our responding to the challenge. 20. If his place of encampment is easy of access, he is tendering a bait. 21. Movement amongst the trees of a forest shows that the enemy is advancing. Tiaseo Kung explains this as felling trees to clear a passage. And Chang Yu says, Every man sends out scouts to climb high places and observe the enemy. If a scout sees that the trees of a forest are moving and shaking, he may know that they are being cut down to clear a passage for the enemy's march. The appearance of a number of screens in the midst of thick grass means that the enemy wants to make us suspicious. To use explanation, borrowed from Tiaseo Kung's, is as follows. The presence of a number of screens or sheds in the midst of thick vegetation is a sure sign that the enemy has fled and, fearing pursuit, has constructed these hiding places in order to make us suspect an ambush. It appears that these screens were hastily knotted together out of any long grass which the retreating enemy happened to come across. 22. The rising of birds in their flight is the sign of an ambuscade. Chan Yu's explanation is doubtless right. When birds that are flying along in a straight line suddenly shoot upwards, it means that soldiers are in ambush at the spot beneath. Startled beasts indicate that a sudden attack is coming. 23. When there is dust rising in a high column, it is the sign of chariots advancing. When the dust is low, but spread over a wide area, it betokens the approach of infantry. High and sharp, or rising to a peak, is of course somewhat exaggerated as applied to dust. The commentators explain the phenomenon by saying that horses and chariots, being heavier than men, raise more dust, and also follow one another in the same will track, whereas foot soldiers would be marching in ranks, many abreast. According to Chan Yu, every army on the march must have scouts some way in advance, who on sighting dust raised by the enemy, will gallop back and report it to the commander-in-chief. C.F. General Baden-Powell As you move along, say, in a hostile country, your eyes should be looking afar for the enemy or any signs of him. Figures, dust rising, birds getting up, glitter of arms, etc. 1. When it branches out in different directions, it shows that parties have been sent to collect firewood. A few clouds of dust moving to and fro signify that the army is encamping. Chang Yu says, In apportioning the defenses for a cantonment, Light horse will be sent out to survey the position and ascertain the weak and strong points all along its circumference. Hence the small quantity of dust and its motion. 24. Humble words and increased preparations are signs that the enemy is about to advance. As though they stood in great fear of us, says Tumu. Their object is to make us contemptuous and careless, after which they will attack us. Chan Yu alludes to the story of Tian Tan of the Qi Mo against the Yen forces, led by Qi Qi. In CH 82 of the Shi Qi we read, Tian Tan openly said, My only fear is that the Yen army may cut off the noses of their Qi prisoners and place them in the front rank to fight against us. That would be the undoing of our city. The other side being informed of this speech, at once acted on the suggestion. But those within the city were enraged at seeing their fellow countrymen thus mutilated 
and fearing only lest they should fall into the enemy's hands, were nerved to defend themselves more obstinately than ever. Once again Tian Tan sent back converted spies who reported these words to the enemy. What I dread most is that the men of Yen may dig up the ancestral tombs outside the town, and by inflicting this indignity on our forefathers cause us to become faint-hearted. Forthwith the besiegers dug up all the graves and burned the corpses lying in them. And the inhabitants of Chiemo, witnessing the outrage from the city walls, wept passionately and were all impatient to go out and fight, their fury being increased tenfold. Tian Tan knew then that his soldiers were ready for any enterprise. But instead of a sword, he himself took a mattock in his hands, and ordered others to be distributed amongst his best warriors, while the ranks were filled up with their wives and concubines. He then served out all the remaining rations and bade his men eat their fill. The regular soldiers were told to keep out of sight, and the walls were manned with the old and weaker men and with women. This done, envoys were dispatched to the enemy's camp to arrange terms of surrender, whereupon the Yen army began shouting for joy. Tian Tan also collected twenty thousand ounces of silver from the people, and got the wealthy citizens of Xiemo to send it to the Yen general with the prayer that, when the town capitulated, he would not allow their homes to be plundered or their women to be maltreated. Shi Qi, in high good humor, granted their prayer, but his army now became increasingly slack and careless. Meanwhile, Tian Tan got together a thousand oxen, decked them with pieces of red silk, painted their bodies, dragon-like, with colored stripes, and fastened sharp blades on their horns and well-greased rushes on their tails. When night came on, he lighted the ends of the rushes, and drove the oxen through a number of holes which he had pierced in the walls, backing them up with a force of five thousand picked warriors. The animals, maddened with pain, dashed furiously into the enemy's camp where they caused the utmost confusion and dismay for their tails acted as torches, showing up the hideous pattern on their bodies, and the weapons on their horns killed or wounded any with whom they came into contact. In the meantime, the band of five thousand had crept up with gags in their mouths, and now threw themselves on the enemy. At the same moment a frightful din arose in the city itself, all those that remained behind making as much noise as possible by banging drums and hammering on bronze vessels, until heaven and earth were convulsed by the uproar. Terror-stricken, the Yen army fled in disorder, hotly pursued by the men of Qi, who succeeded in slaying their general Qi Qian. The result of the battle was the ultimate recovery of some seventy cities which had belonged to the Qi state. Violent language and driving forward as if to the attack are signs that he will retreat. 25. When the light chariots come out first and take up a position on the wings, it is a sign that the enemy is forming for battle. 26. Peace proposals unaccompanied by a sworn covenant indicate a plot. The reading here is uncertain. Li Xiechuan indicates. A treaty confirmed by oaths and hostages. Wang Xi and Chan Yu, on the other hand, simply say. Without reason, on a frivolous pretext. 27. When there is much running about every man hastening to his proper place under his own regimental banner. And the soldiers fall into rank it means that the critical moment has come. 28. When some are seen advancing and some retreating, it is a lure. 29. When the soldiers stand leaning on their spears, they are faint from want of food. 30. If those who are sent to draw water begin by drinking themselves, the army is suffering from thirst. As Tu Mu remarks, One may know the condition of a whole army from the behavior of a single man. 31. If the enemy sees an advantage to be gained and makes no effort to secure it, the soldiers are exhausted. 32. If birds gather on any spot, it is unoccupied. A useful fact to bear in mind when, for instance, as C.H.N. House says, the enemy has secretly abandoned his camp. Clamor by night betokens nervousness. 33. If there is disturbance in the camp, the general's authority is weak. If the banners and flags are shifted about, sedition is afoot. If the officers are angry, it means that the men are weary. Tumu understands the sentence differently. If all the officers of an army are angry with their general, it means that they are broken with fatigue, owing to the exertions which he has demanded from them. 34. When an army feeds its horses with grain and kills its cattle for food. 
in the ordinary course of things the men would be fed on grain and the horses chiefly on grass and when the men do not hang their cooking pots over the camp fires showing that they will not return to their tents you may know that they are determined to fight to the death i may quote here the illustrative passage from the ho han shu ch seventy one given in abbreviated form by the pei wen yin fu the rebel wang kuo of liang was besieging the town of chn tsong and huang fu sung who was in supreme command and tung cho were sent out against him the latter pressed for hasty measures but some turned a deaf ear to his counsel at last the rebels were utterly worn out and began to throw down their weapons of their own accord some was not advancing to the attack but cho said it is a principle of war not to pursue desperate men and not to press a retreating host sung answered that does not apply here what i am about to attack is a jaded army not a retreating host with disciplined troops i am falling on a disorganized multitude not a band of desperate men thereupon he advances to the attack unsupported by his colleague and routed the enemy wang kuo being slain thirty five the sight of men whispering together in small knots or speaking in subdued tones points to disaffection amongst the rank and file thirty six too frequent rewards signify that the enemy is at the end of his resources because when an army is hard pressed as tu mu says there is always a fear of mutiny and lavish rewards are given to keep the men in good temper too many punishments betray a condition of dire distress because in such case discipline becomes relaxed and unwanted severity is necessary to keep the men to their duty thirty seven to begin by bluster but afterwards to take fright at the enemy's numbers shows a supreme lack of intelligence i follow the interpretation of tsao kum also adopted by li Yuan, tu mu and chan yu another possible meaning set forth by tu yu chia lin mei tao chn and wang shi is the general who is first tyrannical towards his men and then in terror lest they should mutiny etc this would connect the sentence with what went before about rewards and punishments thirty eight when envoys are sent with compliments in their mouths it is a sign that the enemy wishes for a truce tumu says if the enemy open friendly relations be sending hostages it is a sign that they are anxious for an armistice either because their strength is exhausted or for some other reason but it hardly needs a sun tzu to draw such an obvious inference thirty nine if the enemy's troops march up angrily and remain facing ours for a long time without either joining battle or taking themselves off again the situation is one that demands great vigilance and circumspection tseo kung says a maneuver of this sort may be only a ruse to gain time for an unexpected flank attack or the laying of an ambush forty if our troops are no more in number than the enemy that is amply sufficient it only means that no direct attack can be made literally no martial advance that is to say ching tactics and frontal attacks must be eschewed and stratagem resorted to instead what we can do is simply to concentrate all our available strength keep a close watch on the enemy and obtain reinforcements this is an obscure sentence and none of the commentators succeed in squeezing very good sense out of it i follow li Yuan, who appears to offer the simplest explanation only the side that gets more men will win fortunately we have chan yu to expound its meaning to us in language which is lucidity itself when the numbers are even and no favorable opening presents itself although we may not be strong enough to deliver a sustained attack we can find additional recruits amongst our settlers and camp followers and then concentrating our forces and keeping a close watch on the enemy contrive to snatch the victory but we must avoid borrowing foreign soldiers to help us he then quotes from wei liao tsu ch three the nominal strength of mercenary troops may be one hundred thousand but their real value will be not more than half that figure forty one he who exercises no forethought but makes light of his opponents is sure to be captured by them ch n hao quoting from the tso chuan says if bees and scorpions carry poison how much more will a hostile state even a puny opponent then should not be treated with contempt forty two if soldiers are punished before they have grown attached to you they will not prove submissive and unless submissive then will be practically useless if 
when the soldiers have become attached to you punishments are not enforced they will still be useless 43 therefore soldiers must be treated in the first instance with humanity but kept under control by means of iron discipline yen tsu bc 493 said of su ma jang chu his civil virtues endeared him to the people his martial prowess kept his enemies in awe. cf wu tsu ch4 in it the ideal commander unites culture with a warlike temper the profession of arms requires a combination of hardness and tenderness this is a certain road to victory 44 if in training soldiers commands are habitually enforced the army will be well disciplined if not its discipline will be bad 45 if a general shows confidence in his men but always insists on his orders being obeyed tumu says a general ought in time of peace to show kindly confidence in his men and also make his authority respected so that when they come to face the enemy orders may be executed and discipline maintained because they all trust and look up to him what sun tzu has said in forty four however would lead one rather to expect something like this if a general is always confident that his orders will be carried out etc the gain will be mutual chang yu says the general has confidence in the men under his command and the men are docile having confidence in him thus the gain is mutual he quotes a pregnant sentence from wei liao tsu ch4 the art of giving orders is not to try to rectify minor blunders and not to be swayed by petty doubts vacillation and fussiness are the surest means of sapping the confidence of an army one aids to scouting page twenty six chapter ten terrain only about a third of the chapter comprising one thirteen deals with terrain the subject being more fully treated in ch eleven the six calamities are discussed in fourteen twenty and the rest of the chapter is again a mere string of desultory remarks though not less interesting perhaps on that account one sun tzu said we may distinguish six kinds of terrain to wit one accessible ground mei yao siegen says plentifully provided with roads and means of communications two entangling ground the same commentator says net like country venturing into which you become entangled three temporizing ground ground which allows you to stave off or delay for narrow passes five precipitous heights six positions at a great distance from the enemy it is hardly necessary to point out the faultiness of this classification a strange lack of logical perception is shown in the chinaman's unquestioning acceptance of glaring cross divisions such as the above two ground which can be freely traversed by both sides is called accessible three with regard to ground of this nature be before the enemy in occupying the raised and sunny spots and carefully guard your line of supplies the general meaning of the last phrase is doubtlessly as to you says not to allow the enemy to cut your communications in view of napoleon's dictum the secret of war lies in the communications one we could wish that sun tzu had done more than skirt the edge of this important subject here and in i ten seven eleven colonel henderson says the line of supply may be said to be as vital to the existence of an army as the heart to the life of a human being just as the duelist who finds his adversary's point menacing him with certain death and his own guard astray is compelled to conform to his adversary's movements and to content himself with warding off his thrusts so the commander whose communications are suddenly threatened finds himself in a false position and he will be fortunate if he has not to change all his plans to split up his force into more or less isolated detachments and to fight with inferior numbers on ground which he has not had time to prepare and where defeat will not be an ordinary failure but will entail the ruin or surrender of his whole army two then you will be able to fight with advantage four ground which can be abandoned but is hard to reoccupy is called entangling five from a position of this sort if the enemy is unprepared you may sally forth and defeat him but if the enemy is prepared for your coming and you fail to defeat him then return being impossible disaster will ensue six 
when the position is such that neither side will gain by making the first move it is called temporizing ground tumu says each side finds it inconvenient to move and the situation remains at a deadlock seven in a position of this sort even though the enemy should offer us an attractive bait to you says turning their backs on us and pretending to flee but this is only one of the lures which might induce us to quit our position it will be advisable not to stir forth but rather to retreat thus enticing the enemy in his turn then when part of his army has come out we may deliver our attack with advantage eight with regard to narrow passes if you can occupy them first let them be strongly garrisoned and await the advent of the enemy because then as to you observes the initiative will lie with us and by making sudden and unexpected attacks we shall have the enemy at our mercy nine should the enemy forestall you in occupying a pass do not go after him if the pass is fully garrisoned but only if it is weakly garrisoned ten with regard to precipitous heights if you are beforehand with your adversary you should occupy the raised and sunny spots and there wait for him to come up tiaseo kung says the particular advantage of securing heights and defile is that your actions cannot then be dictated by the enemy for the enunciation of the grand principle alluded to c six two chan yu tells the following anecdote of pei xing qian ad six nineteen six eighty two who was sent on a punitive expedition against the turkic tribes at night he pitched his camp as usual and it had already been completely fortified by wall and ditch when suddenly he gave orders that the army should shift its quarters to a hill near by this was highly displeasing to his officers who protested loudly against the extra fatigue which it would entail on the men pei xing qian however paid no heed to their remonstrances and had the camp moved as quickly as possible the same night a terrific storm came on which flooded their former place of encampment to the depth of over twelve feet the recalcitrant officers were amazed at the sight and owned that they had been in the wrong how did you know what was going to happen they asked pei xing qian replied from this time forward be content to obey orders without asking unnecessary questions from this it may be seen chan yu continues that high and sunny places are advantageous not only for fighting but also because they are immune from disastrous floods eleven if the enemy has occupied them before you do not follow him but retreat and try to entice him away the turning point of li shi min's campaign in 621 a.d against the two rebels tu qian ti king of xia and wan shi si chum prince of ching was his seizure of the heights of wu lao in spite of which tu qian ti persisted in his attempt to relieve his ally in lo yam was defeated and taken prisoner si chiu tang shu ch2 folios five verso and also ch54 12 if you are situated at a great distance from the enemy and the strength of the two armies is equal it is not easy to provoke a battle the point is that we must not think of undertaking a long and wearisome march at the end of which as to you says we should be exhausted and our adversary fresh and keen and fighting will be to your disadvantage thirteen these six are the principles connected with earth or perhaps the principles relating to ground see however i eight the general who has attained a responsible post must be careful to study them fourteen now an army is exposed to six several calamities not arising from natural causes but from faults for which the general is responsible these are one flight two insubordination three collapse four ruin five disorganization six rout fifteen other conditions being equal if one force is hurled against another ten times its size the result will be the flight of the former sixteen when the common soldiers are too strong and their officers too weak the result is insubordination two mu cites the unhappy case of tian pu hsin tang shu ch one forty eight who was sent to wei in eight hundred and twenty one a d with orders to lead an army against wang ting t so yu but the whole time he was in command his soldiers treated him with the utmost contempt and openly flouted his authority by riding about the camp on donkeys several thousands at a time 
Tian Pu was powerless to put a stop to this conduct, and when, after some months had passed, he made an attempt to engage the enemy, his troops turned tail and dispersed in every direction. After that, the unfortunate man committed suicide by cutting his throat. When the officers are too strong and the common soldiers too weak, the result is collapse. Tiaseo Kung says, The officers are energetic and want to press on. The common soldiers are feeble and suddenly collapse. 17. When the higher officers are angry and insubordinate, and on meeting the enemy give battle on their own account from a feeling of resentment, before the commander-in-chief can tell whether or no he is in a position to fight, the result is ruin. One she's note is, this means the general is angry without cause and at the same time does not appreciate the ability of his subordinate officers thus he arouses fierce resentment and brings an avalanche of ruin upon his head eighteen when the general is weak and without authority when his orders are not clear and distinct wei liao tzu ch4 says if the commander gives his orders with decision the soldiers will not wait to hear them twice if his moves are made without vacillation, the soldiers will not be in two minds about doing their duty. General Baden-Powell says, italicizing the words, The secret of getting successful work out of your trained men lies in one nutshell in the clearness of the instructions they receive. 3. CF also Wu Tzu CH3 The most fatal defect in a military leader is difference. The worst calamities that befall an army arise from hesitation when there are no fixed duties assigned to officers and men. Tumu says, Neither officers nor men have any regular routine, and the ranks are formed in a slovenly haphazard manner, the result is utter disorganization. 19. When a general, unable to estimate the enemy's strength, allows an inferior force to engage a larger one, or hurls a weak detachment against a powerful one, and neglects to place pick soldiers in the front rank, the result must be a rout. Cha Yu paraphrases the latter part of the sentence and continues. Whenever there is fighting to be done, Bikinist spirits should be appointed to serve in the front ranks, both in order to strengthen the resolution of our own men and to demoralize the enemy. Cf. the Primi Ordines of Caesar. De Bello Gallico. V. 2844 et al. 20. These are six ways of courting defeat which must be carefully noted by the general who has attained a responsible post. See Supra 13. 21. The natural formation of the country is the soldier's best ally. C.H.N. House says, The advantages of weather and season are not equal to those connected with ground. But a power of estimating the adversary, of controlling the forces of victory, and of shrewdly calculating difficulties, dangers and distances, constitutes the test of a great general. 22. He who knows these things, and in fighting puts his knowledge into practice, will win his battles. He who knows them not, nor practices them, will surely be defeated. 23. If fighting is sure to result in victory, then you must fight, even though the ruler forbid it. If fighting will not result in victory, then you must not fight even at the ruler's bidding. CF 8. 3. Fin. Huang Shikung of the Qin dynasty, who is said to have been the patron of Chan Liang and to have written the San Le, has these words attributed to him. The responsibility of setting an army in motion must devolve on the general alone. If advance and retreat are controlled from the palace, brilliant results will hardly be achieved. Hence the godlike ruler and the enlightened monarch are content to play a humble part in furthering their country's cause lit. Kneel down to push the chariot wheel. This means that, in matters lying outside the Zenana, the decision of the military commander must be absolute. Chan Yu also quote the saying, Decrees from the Son of Heaven do not penetrate the walls of a camp. 24. The general who advances without coveting fame and retreats without fearing disgrace. It was Wellington, I think, who said that the hardest thing of all for a soldier is to retreat, whose only thought is to protect his country and do good service for his sovereign, is the jewel of the kingdom. A noble presentiment, in few words, of the Chinese. Happy warrior! Such a man, says Ho Shi, even if he had to suffer punishment, would not regret his conduct. 25. Regard your soldiers as your children, and they will follow you into the deepest valleys. 
look on them as your own beloved sons, and they will stand by you even unto death. CFI 6. In this connection, Tu Mu draws for us an engaging picture of the famous General Wu Qi, from whose treatise on war I have frequently had occasion to quote. He wore the same clothes and ate the same food as the meanest of his soldiers, refused to have either a horse to ride or a mat to sleep on, carried his own surplus rations wrapped in a parcel, and shared every hardship with his men. One of his soldiers was suffering from an abscess, and Wu Qi himself sucked out the virus. The soldier's mother, hearing this, began wailing and lamenting. Somebody asked her, saying, Why do you cry? Your son is only a common soldier, and yet the commander-in-chief himself has sucked the poison from his sore. The woman replied, Many years ago, Lord Wu performed a similar service for my husband, who never left him afterwards, and finally met his death at the hands of the enemy. And now that he has done the same for my son, he too will fall fighting I know not where. Li Xiechuan mentions the Viscount of Xiechu, who invaded the small state of Xiao during the winter. The Duke of Shen said to him, Many of the soldiers are suffering severely from the cold. So he made a round of the whole army, comforting and encouraging the men, and straightway they felt as if they were clothed in garments lined with floss silk. 26. If, however, you are indulgent, but unable to make your authority felt, kind-hearted, but unable to enforce your commands, and incapable, moreover, of quelling disorder, then your soldiers must be likened to spoiled children. They are useless for any practical purpose. Li Qing once said that if you could make your soldiers afraid of you, they would not be afraid of the enemy. Tu Mu recalls an instance of stern military discipline which occurred in 219 AD, when Lu Meng was occupying the town of Changling. He had given stringent orders to his army not to molest the inhabitants nor take anything from them by force. Nevertheless, a certain officer serving under his banner, who happened to be a fellow townsman, ventured to appropriate a bamboo hat belonging to one of the people, in order to wear it over his regulation helmet as a protection against the rain. Lu Ming considered that the fact of his being also a native of Zhu Nan should not be allowed to palliate a clear breach of discipline, and accordingly he ordered his summary execution, the tears rolling down his face, however, as he did so. This act of severity filled the army with wholesome awe, and from that time forth even articles dropped in the highway were not picked up. 27. If we know that our own men are in a condition to attack, but are unaware that the enemy is not open to attack, we have gone only halfway towards victory. That is, Tiaseo Kung says, the issue in this case is uncertain. 28. If we know that the enemy is open to attack, but are unaware that our own men are not in a condition to attack, we have gone only halfway towards victory. CF 3. 13 1. 29. If we know that the enemy is open to attack, and also know that our men are in a condition to attack, but are unaware that the nature of the ground makes fighting impracticable, we have still gone only halfway towards victory. 30. Hence the experienced soldier, once in motion, is never bewildered. Once he has broken camp, he is never at a loss. The reason being, according to Tu Mu, that he has taken his measures so thoroughly as to ensure victory beforehand. He does not move recklessly, says Chan Yu, so that when he does move, he makes no mistakes. 31. Hence the saying, If you know the enemy and know yourself, your victory will not stand in doubt. If you know heaven and know earth, you may make your victory complete. Li Xiechuan sums up as follows. Given a knowledge of three things the affairs of men, the seasons of heaven and the natural advantages of earth dash, victory will invariably crown your battles. 1c. Ponce's de Napoleon Wunner. Number 47. 2. The Science of War. Chapter 2. 3. Aids to Scouting. Page 12. Chapter 11. The Nine Situations. 1. Sun Tzu said, The art of war recognizes nine varieties of ground, one dispersive ground, two facile ground, three contentious ground, four open ground, five ground of intersecting highways, six serious ground, seven difficult ground, eight hemmed in ground, nine desperate ground. 2. When a chieftain is fighting in his own territory, it is dispersive ground. 
so called because the soldiers, being near to their homes and anxious to see their wives and children, are likely to seize the opportunity afforded by a battle and scatter in every direction. In their advance, observes Tumu, they will lack the valor of desperation, and when they retreat, they will find harbors of refuge. 3. When he has penetrated into hostile territory, but to no great distance, it is facile ground. Li Siechuan and Ho Shi say, because of the facility for retreating, and the other commentators give similar explanations. Tu Mu remarks, when your army has crossed the border, you should burn your boats and bridges, in order to make it clear to everybody that you have no hankering after home. 4. Ground the possession of which imports great advantage to either side, is contentious ground. Tumu defines the ground as ground. To be contended for, Tiaseo Kung says, ground on which the few and the weak can defeat the many and the strong, such as the neck of a pass, instanced by Li Siechuan. Thus, Thermopylae was of this classification because the possession of it, even for a few days only, meant holding the entire invading army in check and thus gaining invaluable time. C.F. Wutsu, C.H.V., adding it. For those who have to fight in the ratio of one to ten, there is nothing better than a narrow pass. When Lu Quang was returning from his triumphant expedition to Turkestan in 385 AD, and had got as far as Ai Ho, laden with spoils, Liang Shi, administrator of Liang Chou, taking advantage of the death of Fu Qian, king of Qin, plotted against him and was for barring his way into the province. Yang Han, governor of Kao Chang, counseled him, saying, Lu Kuang is fresh from his victories in the west, and his soldiers are vigorous and meddlesome. If we oppose him in the shifting sands of the desert, we shall be no match for him, and we must therefore try a different plan. Let us hasten to occupy the defile at the mouth of the Kawu Pass, thus cutting him off from supplies of water, and when his troops are prostrated with thirst, we can dictate our own terms without moving. Or if you think that the pass I mention is too far off, we could make a stand against him at the Iwu Pass, which is nearer. The cunning and resource of Tsu Fang himself would be expended in vain against the enormous strength of these two positions. Liang Shi, refusing to act on this advice, was overwhelmed and swept away by the invader. 5. Ground on which each side has liberty of movement is open ground. There are various interpretations of the Chinese adjective for this type of ground. Tiaseo Kung says it means ground covered with a network of roads, like a chessboard. Ho Shi suggested. Ground on which intercommunication is easy. 6. Ground which forms the key to three contiguous states. Tieso Kung defines this as our country adjoining the enemies and a third country conterminous with both. Meng Shi instances the small principality of Qing, which was bounded on the northeast by Qi, on the west by Qin, and on the south by Si Qiu so that he who occupies it first has most of the empire at his command. The belligerent who holds this dominating position can constrain most of them to become his allies. His ground of intersecting highways. 7. When an army has penetrated into the heart of a hostile country, leaving a number of fortified cities in its rear, it is serious ground. Wang Shi explains the name by saying that, when an army has reached such a point, its situation is serious. 8. Mountain forests. Or simply, forests. Rugged steeps, marshes and fens all country that is hard to traverse. This is difficult ground. 9. Ground which is reached through narrow gorges, and from which we can only retire by tortuous paths, so that a small number of the enemy would suffice to crush a large body of our men. This is hemmed in ground. 10. Ground on which we can only be saved from destruction by fighting without delay is desperate ground. The situation, as pictured by Tiaseo Kung, is very similar to the hemmed in ground, except that here escape is no longer possible. A lofty mountain in front, a large river behind, advance impossible, retreat blocked. CHN House says, To be on desperate ground is like sitting in a leaking boat or crouching in a burning house. Tumu quotes from Li Qing a vivid description of the plight of an army thus entrapped. Suppose an army invading hostile territory without the aid of local guides. It falls into a fatal snare and is at the enemy's mercy. 
a ravine on the left a mountain on the right a pathway so perilous that the horses have to be roped together and the chariots carried in slings no passage open in front retreat cut off behind no choice but to proceed in single file then before there is time to range our soldiers in order of battle the enemy is overwhelming strength suddenly appears on the scene advancing we can nowhere take a breathing space retreating we have no haven of refuge we seek a pitched battle but in vain yet standing on the defensive none of us has a moment's respite if we simply maintain our ground whole days and months will crawl by the moment we make a move we have to sustain the enemy's attacks on front and rear the country is wild destitute of water and plants the army is lacking in the necessaries of life the horses are jaded and the men worn out all the resources of strength and skill unavailing the pass so narrow that a single man defending it can check the onset of ten thousand all means of offence in the hands of the enemy all points of vantage already forfeited by ourselves in this terrible plight even though we had the most valiant soldiers and the keenest of weapons how could they be employed with the slightest effect students of greek history may be reminded of the awful close to the sicilian expedition and the agony of the athenians under nicias and demosthenes see thucydides seven seventy eight sqq eleven on dispersive ground therefore fight not on facile ground halt not on contentious ground attack not but rather let all your energies be bent on occupying the advantageous position first so tiasail come lysiachuan and others however suppose the meaning to be that the enemy has already forestalled us sought that it would be sheer madness to attack in the sun tzu Su lu when the king of wu inquires what should be done in this case sun tzu replies the rule with regard to contentious ground is that those in possession have the advantage over the other side if a position of this kind is secured first by the enemy beware of attacking him lure him away by pretending to flee show your banners and sound your drums make a dash for other places that he cannot afford to lose trail brushwood and raise a dust confound his ears and eyes detach a body of your best troops and place it secretly in ambuscade then your opponent will sally forth to the rescue twelve on open ground do not try to block the enemy's way because the attempt would be futile and would expose the blocking force itself to serious risks there are two interpretations available here i follow that of chan yu the other is indicated in tia seo kung's brief note draw closer together i dot e see that a portion of your own army is not cut off on ground of intersecting highways join hands with your allies or perhaps form alliances with neighboring states thirteen on serious ground gather and plunder on this li Xiechuan has the following delicious note when an army penetrates far into the enemy's country care must be taken not to alienate the people by unjust treatment follow the example of the han emperor kao tsu whose march into qin territory was marked by no violation of women or looting of valuables nota bene this was in 207 bc and may well cause us to blush for the christian armies that entered peking in 1980 thus he won the hearts of all in the present passage then i think that the true reading must be not plunder but do not plunder alas i fear that in this instance the worthy commentator's feelings outran his judgment tumu at least has no such illusions he says when encamped on serious ground there being no inducement as yet to advance further and no possibility of retreat one ought to take measures for a protracted resistance by bringing in provisions from all sides and keep a close watch on the enemy in difficult ground keep steadily on the march or in the words of eight two do not encamp fourteen on hemmed in ground resort to stratagem t s o kung says try the effect of some unusual artifice and to you amplifies this by saying in such a position some scheme must be devised which will suit the circumstances and if we can succeed in deluding the enemy the peril may be escaped this is exactly what happened on the famous occasion when hannibal was hemmed in among the mountains on the road to castellinum and to all appearances entrapped by the dictator fabius 
The stratagem which Hannibal devised to baffle his foes was remarkably like that which Tian Tan had also employed with success exactly sixty-two years before. C9. 24. Note. When night came on, bundles of twigs were fastened to the horns of some two thousand oxen and set on fire, the terrified animals being then quickly driven along the mountain side towards the passes which were beset by the enemy. The strange spectacle of these rapidly moving lights so alarmed and discomfited the Romans that they withdrew from their position, and Hannibal's army passed safely through the defile. See Polybius 3. 93-94, Livy XXI. 1617. On desperate ground, fight. For, as Chia Lin remarks, If you fight with all your might there is a chance of life, whereas death is certain if you cling to your corner. 15. Those who were called skillful leaders of old knew how to drive a wedge between the enemy's front and rear. More literally, cause the front and rear to lose touch with each other. To prevent cooperation between his large and small divisions, to hinder the good troops from rescuing the bad, the officers from rallying their men. 16. When the enemy's men were scattered they prevented them from concentrating, even when their forces were united they managed to keep them in disorder. 17. When it was to their advantage, they made a forward move, when otherwise they stopped still. May Yao Chen connects this with the foregoing. Having succeeded in thus dislocating the enemy, they would push forward in order to secure any advantage to be gained. If there was no advantage to be gained, they would remain where they were. 18. If asked how to cope with a great host of the enemy in orderly array and on the point of marching to the attack, I should say, begin by seizing something which your opponent holds dear, then he will be amenable to your will. Opinions differ as to what Sun Tzu had in mind. Tiaseo Kung thinks it is some strategical advantage on which the enemy is depending. Tumu says, the three things which an enemy is anxious to do, and on the accomplishment of which his success depends, are 1. to capture our favorable positions, 2. to ravage our cultivated land, 3. to guard his own communications. Our object then must be to thwart his plans in these three directions, and thus render him helpless. CF 3. 3. By boldly seizing the initiative in this way, you at once throw the other side on the defensive. 19. Rapidity is the essence of war. According to Tu Mu, this is a summary of leading principles in warfare. And he adds, These are the profoundest truths of military science, and the chief business of the general. The following anecdotes, told by Ho Shi, shows the importance attached to speed by two of China's greatest generals. In 227 AD, Meng Ta, governor of HSIN Ching under the Wei Emperor Wen Ti, was meditating defection to the House of Shu and had entered into correspondence with Chu Keo Liang, prime minister of that state. The Wei General Su Ma was then military governor of Wan, and getting wind of Meng Tao's treachery, he at once set off with an army to anticipate his revolt, having previously cajoled him by a specious message of friendly import. Su Ma's officers came to him and said, If Meng Ta has leagued himself with Wu and Xu, the matter should be thoroughly investigated before we make a move. Su Mai replied, Meng Ta is an unprincipled man, and we ought to go and punish him at once, while he is still wavering and before he has thrown off the mask. Then, by a series of forced marches, be brought his army under the walls of HSIN Ching within a space of eight days. Now Meng Ta had previously said in a letter to Chu Keo Liang, Wan is 1,200 li from here. When the news of my revolt reaches Su Mai, he will at once inform his imperial master, but it will be a whole month before any steps can be taken, and by that time my city will be well fortified. Besides, Su Ma I is sure not to come himself, and the generals that will be sent against us are not worth troubling about. The next letter, however, was filled with consternation. Though only eight days have passed since I threw off my allegiance, an army is already at the city gates. What miraculous rapidity is this! A fortnight later, HSIN Ching had fallen and Meng Ta had lost his head. Si Qin Shu, CH1F, 3. In 621 AD, Li Qing was sent from Kei Chou and Su Chuan to reduce the successful rebel Si Xin, who had set up as emperor at the modern Qing Chou Fu in Hupa. 
it was autumn and the yansa being then in flood siao shin never dreamt that his adversary would venture to come down through the gorges and consequently made no preparations but li ching embarked his army without loss of time and was just about to start when the other generals implored him to postpone his departure until the river was in a less dangerous state for navigation li ching replied to the soldier overwhelming speed is of paramount importance and he must never miss opportunities now is the time to strike before siao shin even knows that we have got an army together if we seize the present moment when the river is in flood we shall appear before his capital with startling suddenness like the thunder which is heard before you have time to stop your ears against it c seven nineteen note this is the great principle in war even if he gets to know of our approach he will have to levy his soldiers in such a hurry that they will not be fit to oppose us thus the full fruits of victory will be ours all came about as he predicted and siao shin was obliged to surrender nobly stipulating that his people should be spared and he alone suffer the penalty of death take advantage of the enemy's unreadiness make your way by unexpected routes and attack unguarded spots twenty the following are the principles to be observed by an invading force the further you penetrate into a country the greater will be the solidarity of your troops and thus the defenders will not prevail against you twenty one make forays in fertile country in order to supply your army with food c f supra thirteen lisiatuin does not venture on a note here twenty two carefully study the well-being of your men for well-being one she means pet them humor them give them plenty of food and drink and look after them generally and do not overtax them concentrate your energy and hoard your strength c h n recalls the line of action adopted in two twenty four b c by the famous general wang qian whose military genius largely contributed to the success of the first emperor he had invaded the c h u state where a universal levy was made to oppose him but being doubtful of the temper of his troops he declined all invitations to fight and remained strictly on the defensive in vain did the c h u general try to force a battle day after day wang qian kept inside his walls and would not come out but devoted his whole time and energy to winning the affection and confidence of his men he took care that they should be well fed sharing his own meals with them provided facilities for bathing and employed every method of judicious indulgence to weld them into a loyal and homogeneous body after some time had elapsed he told off certain persons to find out how the men were amusing themselves the answer was that they were contending with one another in putting the weight and long jumping when wang qian heard that they were engaged in these athletic pursuits he knew that their spirits had been strung up to the required pitch and that they were now ready for fighting by this time the chu army after repeating their challenge again and again had marched away eastwards in disgust the qin general immediately broke up his camp and followed them and in the battle that ensued they were routed with great slaughter shortly afterwards the whole of chu was conquered by chin and the king fu chu led into captivity keep your army continually on the move in order that the enemy may never know exactly where you are it has struck me however that the true reading might be link your army together and devise unfathomable plans twenty three throw your soldiers into positions whence there is no escape and they will prefer death to flight if they will face death there is nothing they may not achieve chan yu quotes his favorite way liao tzu ch three if one man were to run amuck with a sword in the market-place and everybody else tried to get out of his way i should not allow that this man alone had courage and that all the rest were contemptible cowards the truth is that a desperado and a man who sets some value on his life do not meet on even terms officers and men alike will put forth their uttermost strength chang yu says if they are in an awkward place together they will surely exert their united strength to get out of it twenty four soldiers when in desperate straits lose the sense of fear if there is no place of refuge they will stand firm if they are in the heart of a hostile country they will show a stubborn front if there is no help for it they will fight hard twenty five thus without waiting to be marshalled 
the soldiers will be constantly on the kavive. Without waiting to be asked, they will do your will. Literally. Without asking, you will get. Without restrictions, they will be faithful. Without giving orders, they can be trusted. 26. Prohibit the taking of omens, and do away with superstitious doubts. Then, until death itself comes, no calamity need be feared. The superstitious, bound into saucy doubts and fears, degenerate into cowards and die many times before their deaths. Tu mu quotes Huang Shi come. Spells and incantations should be strictly forbidden, and no officer allowed to inquire by divination into the fortunes of an army, for fear the soldiers' minds should be seriously perturbed. The meaning is, he continues, that if all doubts and scruples are discarded, your men will never falter in their resolution until they die. 27. If our soldiers are not overburdened with money, it is not because they have a distaste for riches. If their lives are not unduly long, it is not because they are disinclined to longevity. Chan Yu has the best note on this passage. Wealth and long life are things for which all men have a natural inclination. Hence, if they burn or fling away valuables, and sacrifice their own lives, it is not that they dislike them, but simply that they have no choice. Sun Tzu is slyly insinuating that, as soldiers are but human, it is for the general to see that temptations to shirk fighting and grow rich are not thrown in their way. 28. On the day they are ordered out to battle, your soldiers may weep. The word in the Chinese is snivel. This is taken to indicate more genuine grief than tears alone. Those sitting up bedewing their garments, and those lying down letting the tears run down their cheeks. Not because they are afraid, but because, as Tia Seo Kung says, all have embraced the firm resolution to do or die. We may remember that the heroes of the Iliad were equally childlike in showing their emotion. Chan Yu alludes to the mournful parting at the Ai River between Ching Ko and his friends, when the former was sent to attempt the life of the King of Qin afterwards first emperor in 227 BC. The tears of all flowed down like rain as he bade them farewell and uttered the following lines. The shrill blast is blowing, chilly the burn, your champion is going not to return. 1. But let them once be brought to bay, and they will display the courage of a Chu or a Kei. Chu was the personal name of Chuan Chu, a native of the Wu state and contemporary with Sun Tzu himself, who was employed by Kung Tzu Kuang, better known as Ho Lu Wang, to assassinate his sovereign Wang Liao with a dagger which he secreted in the belly of a fish served up at a banquet. He succeeded in his attempt, but was immediately hacked to pieces by the king's bodyguard. This was in 515 BC. The other hero referred to, Tiaseo K or Tiaseo Mo, performed the exploit which has made his name famous 166 years earlier. In 681 BC Lu had been thrice defeated by Qi, and was just about to conclude a treaty surrendering a large slice of territory, when Tiaseo K suddenly sees Huan Kung, the Duke of Qi, as he stood on the altar steps and held a dagger against his chest. None of the duke's retainers dared to move a muscle, and Tiaseo K proceeded to demand full restitution, declaring the Lu was being unjustly treated because she was a smaller and a weaker state. Huan Kung, in peril of his life, was obliged to consent, whereupon Tiaseo K flung away his dagger and quietly resumed his place amid the terrified assemblage without having so much as changed color. As was to be expected, the duke wanted afterwards to repudiate the bargain, but his wise old counsellor Quan Chung pointed out to him the impolicy of breaking his word, and the upshot was that this bold stroke regained for Lu the whole of what she had lost in three pitched battles. 29. The skillful tactician may be likened to the Shuai January. Now the Shuai Jan is a snake that is found in the Chang Mountains. Shuai Jan means suddenly, or rapidly and the snake in question was doubtless so called owing to the rapidity of its movements. Through this passage, the term in the Chinese has now come to be used in the sense of military maneuvers. Strike at its head, and you will be attacked by its tail. Strike at its tail, and you will be attacked by its head. Strike at its middle, and you will be attacked by head and tail both. 30. Asked if an army can be made to imitate the Shuai Jan. That is, as Mei Yao Chen says, 
Is it possible to make the front and rear of an army each swiftly responsive to attack on the other, just as though they were part of a single living body? I should answer yes. For the men of Wu and the men of Yu are enemies. CF 6. 21. Yet if they are crossing a river in the same boat, and are caught by a storm, they will come to each other's assistance just as the left hand helps the right. The meaning is, if two enemies will help each other in a time of common peril, how much more should two parts of the same army, bound together as they are by every tie of interest and fellow feeling? Yet it is notorious that many a campaign has been ruined through lack of cooperation, especially in the case of allied armies. 31. Hence it is not enough to put one's trust in the tethering of horses, and the burying of chariot wheels in the ground. These quaint devices to prevent one's army from running away recall the Athenian hero Sahanes, who carried the anchor with him at the Battle of Plataea, by means of which he fastened himself firmly to one spot. See Herodotus 9. 74. It is not enough, says Sun Tzu, to render flight impossible by such mechanical means. You will not succeed unless your men have tenacity and unity of purpose, and above all, a spirit of sympathetic cooperation. This is the lesson which can be learned from the Shui Jan. 32. The principle on which to manage an army is to set up one standard of courage which all must reach. Literally, level the courage of all as though it were that of one. If the ideal army is to form a single organic whole, then it follows that the resolution and spirit of its component parts must be of the same quality, or at any rate must not fall below a certain standard. Wellington's seemingly ungrateful description of his army at Waterloo as the worst he had ever commanded meant no more than that it was deficient in this important particular unity of spirit and courage. Had he not foreseen the Belgian defections and carefully kept those troops in the background, he would almost certainly have lost the day. 33. How to make the best of both strong and weak that is a question involving the proper use of ground. May Yao Chen's paraphrase is, the way to eliminate the differences of strong and weak and to make both serviceable is to utilize accidental features of the ground. Less reliable troops, if posted in strong positions, will hold out as long as better troops on more exposed terrain. The advantage of position neutralizes the inferiority in stamina and courage. Colonel Henderson says, With all respect to the textbooks and to the ordinary tactical teaching, I am inclined to think that the study of ground is often overlooked and that by no means sufficient importance is attached to the selection of positions, and to the immense advantages that are to be derived, whether you are defending or attacking, from the proper utilization of natural features. 2. 34. Thus the skillful general conducts his army just as though he were leading a single man, willy-nilly, by the hand. Tumu says, The simile has reference to the ease with which he does it. 35. It is the business of a general to be quiet and thus ensure secrecy, upright and just, and thus maintain order. 36. He must be able to mystify his officers and men by false reports and appearances, literally, to deceive their eyes and ears, and thus keep them in total ignorance. Tiaseo Kung gives us one of his excellent apothems. The troops must not be allowed to share your schemes in the beginning. They may only rejoice with you over their happy outcome. To mystify, mislead, and surprise the enemy is one of the first principles in war, as had been frequently pointed out. But how about the other process, the mystification of one's own men? Those who may think that Sun Tzu is over-emphatic on this point would do well to read Colonel Henderson's remarks on Stonewall Jackson's Valley Campaign. The infinite pains, he says, with which Jackson sought to conceal, even from his most trusted staff officers, his movements, his intentions, and his thoughts, a commander less thorough would have pronounced useless, etc., etc. 3 in the year 88 AD, as we read in CH 47 of the Hohan Shu. Pansi Cheo took the field with 25,000 men from Khotan, and other Central Asian states with the object of crushing Yarkand. The king of Kutcha replied by dispatching his chief commander to succor the place with an army drawn from the kingdoms of Wunsu, Ku Emo, and Wei Tiuyu, totaling 50,000 men. Pen Si Cheo summoned his officers and also the king of Khotan to a council of war, and said, 
our forces are now outnumbered and unable to make head against the enemy the best plan then is for us to separate and disperse each in a different direction the king of Khotan will march away by the easterly route and i will then return myself towards the west let us wait until the evening drum has sounded and then start pansicheo now secretly released the prisoners whom he had taken alive and the king of kutcha was thus informed of his plans much elated by the news the latter set off at once at the head of ten thousand horsemen to bar pan Cheo's retreat in the west while the king of wensu rode eastward with eight thousand horse in order to intercept the king of khotan as soon as pan Cheo knew that the two chieftains had gone he called his divisions together got them well in hand and at cock crow hurled them against the army of yarkand as it lay encamped the barbarians panic-stricken fled in confusion and were closely pursued by pan Cheo. over five thousand heads were brought back as trophies besides immense spoils in the shape of horses and cattle and valuables of every description yarkan then capitulating cut shah and the other kingdoms drew off their respective forces from that time forward pan Cheo's prestige completely overawed the countries of the west in this case we see that the chinese general not only kept his own officers in ignorance of his real plans but actually took the bold step of dividing his army in order to deceive the enemy thirty seven by altering his arrangements and changing his plans one she thinks that this means not using the same stratagem twice he keeps the enemy without definite knowledge chan yu in a quotation from another work says the axiom that war is based on deception does not apply only to deception of the enemy you must deceive even your own soldiers make them follow you but without letting them know why by shifting his camp and taking circuitous routes he prevents the enemy from anticipating his purpose thirty eight at the critical moment the leader of an army acts like one who has climbed up a height and then kicks away the ladder behind him he carries his men deep into hostile territory before he shows his hand literally releases the spring c v fifteen that is takes some decisive step which makes it impossible for the army to return like xian yu who sunk his ships after crossing a river c h n hao followed by chia lin understands the words less well as puts forth every artifice at his command thirty nine he burns his boats and breaks his cooking pots like a shepherd driving a flock of sheep he drives his men this way and that and none knows whither he is going tumu says the army is only cognizant of orders to advance or retreat it is ignorant of the ulterior ends of attacking and conquering forty to muster his host and bring it into danger this may be termed the business of the general sun tzu means that after mobilization there should be no delay in aiming a blow at the enemy's heart note how he returns again and again to this point among the warring states of ancient china desertion was no doubt a much more present fear and serious evil than it is in the armies of today. forty one the different measures suited to the nine varieties of ground chang yu says one must not be hide bound in interpreting the rules for the nine varieties of ground the expediency of aggressive or defensive tactics and the fundamental laws of human nature these are things that must most certainly be studied forty two when invading hostile territory the general principle is that penetrating deeply brings cohesion penetrating but a short way means dispersion c f supra twenty forty three when you leave your own country behind and take your army across neighborhood territory you find yourself on critical ground this ground is curiously mentioned in eight two but it does not figure among the nine situations or the six calamities in chapter ten one's first impulse would be to translate it distant ground but this if we can trust the commentators is precisely what is not meant here may yao chn says it is a position not far enough advanced to be called facile and not near enough to home to be dispersive but something between the two one she says it is ground separated from home by an interjacent state whose territory we have had to cross in order to reach it hence it is incumbent on us to settle our business there quickly he adds that this position is of rare occurrence 
which is the reason why it is not included among the nine situations. When there are means of communication on all four sides, the ground is one of intersecting highways. 44. When you penetrate deeply into a country, it is serious ground. When you penetrate but a little way, it is facile ground. 45. When you have the enemy's strongholds on your rear, and narrow passes in front, it is hemmed in ground. When there is no place of refuge at all, it is desperate ground. 46. Therefore, on dispersive ground, I would inspire my men with unity of purpose. This end, according to Tu Mu, is best attained by remaining on the defensive and avoiding battle. CF Supra 11. On facile ground, I would see that there is close connection between all parts of my army. As Tu Mu says, the object is to guard against two possible contingencies. One, the desertion of our own troops, to a sudden attack on the part of the enemy. CF 7. 17. Mei Yao CHN says, On the march, the regiments should be in close touch. In an encampment, there should be continuity between the fortifications. 47. On contentious ground, I would hurry up my rear. This is Tiaseo Kung's interpretation. Chan Yu adopts it, saying, We must quickly bring up our rear, so that head and tail may both reach the goal. That is, they must not be allowed to straggle up a long way apart. Mei Yao Chen offers another equally plausible explanation. Supposing the enemy has not yet reached the coveted position, and we are behind him, we should advance with all speed in order to dispute its possession. Chen Hao, on the other hand, assuming that the enemy has had time to select his own ground, quotes 6. 1. Where Sun Tzu warns us against coming exhausted to the attack. His own idea of the situation is rather vaguely expressed. If there is a favorable position lying in front of you, detach a picked body of troops to occupy it, then if the enemy, relying on their numbers, come up to make a fight for it, you may fall quickly on their rear with your main body, and victory will be assured. It was thus, he adds, that Chao Shi beat the army of Qin. See page 57. 48. On open ground, I would keep a vigilant eye on my defenses. On ground of intersecting highways, I would consolidate my alliances. 49. On serious ground, I would try to ensure a continuous stream of supplies. The commentators take this as referring to forage and plunder, not, as one might expect, to an unbroken communication with a home base. On difficult ground, I would keep pushing on along the road. 50. On hemmed in ground, I would block any way of retreat. Meng Shi says, to make it seem that I meant to defend the position, whereas my real intention is to burst suddenly through the enemy's lines. Mei Yao Siejian says, In order to make my soldiers fight with desperation. Wang Shi says, Fearing lest my men be tempted to run away. Tu Mu points out that this is the converse of 7. 36. Where it is the enemy who is surrounded. In 532 AD, Cao Huan, afterwards emperor and canonized as Xin Wu, was surrounded by a great army under a Chu Chao and others. His own force was comparatively small, consisting only of 2,000 horse and something under 30,000 foot. The lines of investment had not been drawn very closely together, gaps being left at certain points. But Cao Huan, instead of trying to escape, actually made a shift to block all the remaining outlets himself by driving into them a number of oxen and donkeys roped together. As soon as his officers and men saw that there was nothing for it but to conquer or die, their spirits rose to an extraordinary pitch of exultation, and they charged with such desperate ferocity that the opposing ranks broke and crumbled under their onslaught. On desperate ground, I would proclaim to my soldiers the hopelessness of saving their lives. To you says, Burn your baggage and impedimenta, throw away your stores and provisions, choke up the wells, destroy your cooking stoves, and make it plain to your men that they cannot survive, but must fight to the death. Mei Yao Siejian says, The only chance of life lies in giving up all hope of it. This concludes what Sun Tzu has to say about grounds and their variations corresponding to them. Reviewing the passages which bear on this important subject, we cannot fail to be struck by the desultory and unmethodical fashion in which it is treated. Sun Tzu begins abruptly in eight. Two to enumerate variations, 
before touching on grounds at all but only mentions five namely numbers seven five eight and nine of the subsequent list and one that is not included in it a few varieties of ground are dealt with in the earlier portion of chapter nine and then chapter ten sets forth six new grounds with six variations of plan to match none of these is mentioned again though the first is hardly to be distinguished from ground number four in the next chapter at last in chapter eleven we come to the nine grounds par excellence immediately followed by the variations this takes us down to fourteen in forty three forty five fresh definitions are provided for numbers five six two eight and nine in the order given as well as for the tenth ground noticed in chapter eight and finally the nine variations are enumerated once more from beginning to end all with the exception of five six and seven being different from those previously given though it is impossible to account for the present state of sun Tzu's text a few suggestive facts may be brought into prominence one chapter eight according to the title should deal with nine variations whereas only five appear two it is an abnormally short chapter three chapter eleven is entitled the nine grounds several of these are defined twice over besides which there are two distinct lists of the corresponding variations for the length of the chapter is disproportionate being double that of any other except nine i do not propose to draw any inferences from these facts beyond the general conclusion that sun tzu's work cannot have come down to us in the shape in which it left his hands chapter eight is obviously defective and probably out of place while eleven seems to contain matter that has either been added by a later hand or ought to appear elsewhere fifty one for it is the soldier's disposition to offer an obstinate resistance when surrounded to fight hard when he cannot help himself and to obey promptly when he has fallen into danger Chan Yu alludes to the conduct of Pan Chao's devoted followers in 73 AD. The story runs thus in the Ho Han Shu, ch. 47. When Pan Chao arrived at Shan Shan, Quan, the king of the country, received him at first with great politeness and respect, but shortly afterwards his behavior underwent a sudden change, and he became remiss and negligent. Pan Chao spoke about this to the officers of his suite. Have you noticed, he said, that Kuang's polite intentions are on the wane? This must signify that envoys have come from the northern barbarians, and that consequently he is in a state of indecision, not knowing with which side to throw in his lot. That surely is the reason. The truly wise man, we are told, can perceive things before they have come to pass, how much more, then, those that are already manifest. Thereupon he called one of the natives who had been assigned to his service, and set a trap for him, saying, Where are those envoys from the Sung Nu who arrived some day ago? The man was so taken aback that between surprise and fear he presently blurted out the whole truth. Pen Cheo, keeping his informant carefully under lock and key, then summoned a general gathering of his officers, thirty-six in all, and began drinking with them. When the wine had mounted into their heads a little, he tried to rouse their spirits still further by addressing them thus, Gentlemen, here we are in the heart of an isolated region, anxious to achieve riches and honor by some great exploit. Now it happens that an ambassador from the Sung No arrived in this kingdom only a few days ago, and the result is that the respectful courtesy extended towards us by our royal host has disappeared. Should this envoy prevail upon him to seize our party and hand us over to the Sung No, our bones will become food for the wolves of the desert. What are we to do? With one accord, the officers replied, Standing as we do in peril of our lives, we will follow our commander through life and death. For the sequel of this adventure, see chapter 12. One note. 52. We cannot enter into alliance with neighboring princes until we are acquainted with their designs. We are not fit to lead an army on the march unless we are familiar with the face of the country its mountains and forests, its pitfalls and precipices, its marshes and swamps. We shall be unable to turn natural advantages to account unless we make use of local guides. These three sentences are repeated from seven, twelve, fourteen inches order to emphasize their importance, the commentators seem to think. I prefer to regard them as interpolated here in order to form an antecedent to the following words. With regard to local guides, Sun Tzu might have added that there is always the risk of going wrong either through their treachery or some misunderstanding such as Livy records XXI. 13. 
Hannibal, we are told, ordered a guide to lead him into the neighborhood of Cassinum, where there was an important pass to be occupied, but his Carthaginian accent, unsuited to the pronunciation of Latin names, caused the guide to understand Cassilinum instead of Cassinum, and turning from his proper route, he took the army in that direction, the mistake not being discovered until they had almost arrived. 53. To be ignorant of any one of the following four or five principles does not befit a warlike prince. 54. When a warlike prince attacks a powerful state, his generalship shows itself in preventing the concentration of the enemy's forces. He overawes his opponents, and their allies are prevented from joining against him. May Tao Chn constructs one of the chains of reasoning that are so much affected by the Chinese. In attacking a powerful state, if you can divide her forces, you will have a superiority in strength. If you have a superiority in strength, you will overawe the enemy. If you overawe the enemy, the neighboring states will be frightened, and if the neighboring states are frightened, the enemy's allies will be prevented from joining her. The following gives a stronger meaning. If the great state has once been defeated before she has had time to summon her allies, then the lesser states will hold aloof and refrain from massing their forces. C.H.N. Hao and Chan Yu take the sentence in quite another way. The former says, Powerful though a prince may be, if he attacks a large state, he will be unable to raise enough troops, and must rely to some extent on external aid. If he dispenses with this, and with overweening confidence in his own strength, simply tries to intimidate the enemy, he will surely be defeated. Chan Yu puts his view thus. If we recklessly attack a large state, our own people will be discontented and hang back. But if, as will then be the case, our display of military force is inferior by half to that of the enemy, the other chieftains will take fright and refuse to join us. 55. Hence he does not strive to ally himself with all and sundry, nor does he foster the power of other states. He carries out his own secret designs, keeping his antagonists in all. The train of thought, as said by Li Siechuan, appears to be this, secure against the combination of his enemies. He can afford to reject entangling alliances and simply pursue his own secret designs. His prestige enable him to dispense with external friendships. Thus he is able to capture their cities and overthrow their kingdoms. This paragraph though written many years before the Qin state became a serious menace, is not a bad summary of the policy by which the famous six chancellors gradually paved the way for her final triumph under Shi Huangti. Chan Yu, following up his previous note, thinks that Sun Tzu is condemning this attitude of cold-blooded selfishness and haughty isolation. 56. Bestow rewards without regard to rule. Wu Tzu CH3 less wisely says, let advance be richly rewarded and retreat be heavily punished. Issue orders literally hang, or post up, without regard to previous arrangements. In order to prevent treachery, says Wang Shi, the general meaning is made clear by Tsao Kung's quotation from the Su Ma Fa. Give instructions only on sighting the enemy. Give rewards when you see deserving deeds. Tsao Kung's paraphrase. The final instructions you give to your army should not correspond with those that have been previously posted up. Chan Yu simplifies this into. Your arrangements should not be divulged beforehand. And Chia Lin says. There should be no fixity in your rules and arrangements. Not only is there danger in letting your plans be known, but war often necessitates the entire reversal of them at the last moment. And you will be able to handle a whole army as though you had to do with but a single man. CF Supra 34. 57. Confront your soldiers with the deed itself. Never let them know your design. Literally. Do not tell them words. I.e. do not give your reasons for any order. Lord Mansfield once told a junior colleague to give no reasons for his decisions, and the maxim is even more applicable to a general than to a judge. When the outlook is bright, bring it before their eyes but tell them nothing when the situation is gloomy. 58. Place your army in deadly peril, and it will survive. Plunge it into desperate straits, and it will come off in safety. These words of Sun Tzu were once quoted by Han Hsin in explanation of the tactics he employed in one of his most brilliant battles, already alluded to on page 28. In 204 BC, he was sent against the army of Chao, 
and halted ten miles from the mouth of the Qingxing Pass, where the enemy had mustered in full force. Here, at midnight, he detached a body of two thousand light cavalry, every man of which was furnished with a red flag. Their instructions were to make their way through narrow defile and keep a secret watch on the enemy. When the men of Chao see me in full flight, Han Hsian said, they will abandon their fortifications and give chase. This must be the sign for you to rush in, pluck down the Chao standards and set up the red banners of Han in their stead. Turning then to his other officers, he remarked, Our adversary holds a strong position, and is not likely to come out and attack us until he sees the standard and drums of the commander-in-chief, for fear I should turn back and escape through the mountains. So saying, he first of all sent out a division consisting of ten thousand men, and ordered them to form in line of battle with their backs to the river T. Seeing this maneuver, the whole army of Chao broke into loud laughter. By this time it was broad daylight, and Han Hsian, displaying the Generalissimo's flag, marched out of the pass with drums beating, and was immediately engaged by the enemy. A great battle followed, lasting for some time until at length Han Hsian and his colleague Chang and I, leaving drums and banner on the field, fled to the division on the river bank, where another fierce battle was raging. The enemy rushed out to pursue them and to secure the trophies, thus denuding their ramparts of men, but the two generals succeeded in joining the other army, which was fighting with the utmost desperation. The time had now come for the two thousand horsemen to play their part. As soon as they saw the men of Chao following up their advantage, they galloped behind the deserted walls, tore up the enemy's flags and replaced them by those of Han. When the Chao army looked back from the pursuit, the sight of these red flags struck them with terror. Convinced that the Hans had got in and overpowered their king, they broke up in wild disorder, every effort of their leader to stay the panic being in vain. Then the Han army fell on them from both sides and completed the rout, killing a number and capturing the rest, amongst whom was King Ye himself. After the battle, some of Han Hsian's officers came to him and said, In the art of war we are told to have a hill or tumulus on the right rear, and a river or marsh on the left front. This appears to be a blend of Sun Tzu and Tai Kung. C99 and note. You, on the contrary, ordered us to draw up our troops with the river at our back. Under these conditions, how did you manage to gain the victory? The general replied, I fear you gentlemen have not studied the art of war with sufficient care. Is it not written there, plunge your army into desperate straits, and it will come off in safety, place it in deadly peril, and it will survive? Had I taken the usual course, I should never have been able to bring my colleague round. What says the military classic swoop down on the marketplace and drive the men off to fight? This passage does not occur in the present text of Sun Tzu. If I had not placed my troops in a position where they were obliged to fight for their lives, but had allowed each man to follow his own discretion, there would have been a general de band-aid, and it would have been impossible to do anything with them. The officers admitted the force of his argument, and said, These are higher tactics than we should have been capable of. C.C.H. Yin Han Shu, C.H. 34, F.F. 4, 5. 59. For it is precisely when a force has fallen into harm's way that is capable of striking a blow for victory. Danger has a bracing effect. 60. Success in warfare is gained by carefully accommodating ourselves to the enemy's purpose. Tiaseo Kung says feign stupidity, by an appearance of yielding and falling in with the enemy's wishes. Chan Yu's note makes the meaning clear. If the enemy shows an inclination to advance, lure him on to do so. If he is anxious to retreat, delay on purpose that he may carry out his intention. The object is to make him remiss and contemptuous before we deliver our attack. 61. By persistently hanging on the enemy's flank. I understand the first four words to mean. Accompanying the enemy in one direction. Tiaseo Kung says. Unite the soldiers and make for the enemy. But such a violent displacement of characters is quite indefensible. We shall succeed in the long run literally. After a thousand li. In killing the commander-in-chief. Always a great point with the Chinese. 62. This is called ability to accomplish a thing by sheer cunning. 63. On the day that you take up your command, block the frontier passes, destroy the official tallies. 
These were tablets of bamboo or wood, one half of which was issued as a permit or passport by the official in charge of a gate. C.F. the Border Warden of Luing U3. 24. Who may have had similar duties. When this half was returned to him, within a fixed period, he was authorized to open the gate and let the traveler through and stop the passage of all emissaries, either to or from the enemy's country. 64. Be stern in the council chamber. Show no weakness, and insist on your plans being ratified by the sovereign, so that you may control the situation. May Yao Chen understands the whole sentence to mean, take the strictest precautions to ensure secrecy in your deliberations. 65. If the enemy leaves the door open, you must rush in. 66. Forestall your opponent by seizing what he holds dear. CF Supra 18. And subtly contrive to time his arrival on the ground. CHN Howe's explanation. If I manage to seize a favorable position, but the enemy does not appear on the scene, the advantage thus obtained cannot be turned to any practical account. He who intends, therefore, to occupy a position of importance to the enemy, must begin by making an artful appointment, so to speak, with his antagonist, and cajole him into going there as well. May Yao Chen explains that this artful appointment is to be made through the medium of the enemy's own spies, who will carry back just the amount of information that we choose to give them. Then, having cunningly disclosed our intentions, we must manage, though starting after the enemy, to arrive before him seven. Four. We must start after him in order to ensure his marching thither. We must arrive before him in order to capture the place without trouble. Taken thus, the present passage lends some support to Mei Yao Chen's interpretation of 47. 67. Walk in the path defined by rule. Chia Lin says, Victory is the only thing that matters, and this cannot be achieved by adhering to conventional canons. It is unfortunate that this variant rests on very slight authority, for the sense yielded is certainly much more satisfactory. Napoleon, as we know, according to the veterans of the old school whom he defeated, won his battles by violating every accepted canon of warfare. And accommodate yourself to the enemy until you can fight a decisive battle. Tumu says, Conform to the enemy's tactics until a favorable opportunity offers. Then come forth and engage in a battle that shall prove decisive. 68. At first, then, exhibit the coyness of a maiden, until the enemy gives you an opening. Afterwards emulate the rapidity of a running hare, and it will be too late for the enemy to oppose you. As the hare is noted for its extreme timidity, the comparison hardly appears felicitous. But of course Sun Tzu was thinking only of its speed. The words have been taken to mean, you must flee from the enemy as quickly as an escaping hare, but this is rightly rejected by Tu Mu. 1 Giles Biographical Dictionary, Number 399. 2. The Science of War, Page 333. 3. Stonewall Jackson, Volume 1, Page 421. Chapter 12. The Attack by Fire. Rather more than half the chapter 113 is devoted to the subject of fire, after which the author branches off into other topics. 1. Sun Tzu said, There are five ways of attacking with fire. The first is to burn soldiers in their camp. So Tu Mu. Li Xiechun says, Set fire to the camp and kill the soldiers, when they try to escape from the flames. Pan Si Cheo sent on a diplomatic mission to the king of Shan Shan Si 11. 51. Note. Found himself placed in extreme peril by the unexpected arrival of an envoy from the Sun Nu, the mortal enemies of the Chinese. In consultation with his officers, he exclaimed, Never venture, never win! One, the only course open to us now is to make an assault by fire on the barbarians under cover of night, when they will not be able to discern our numbers. Profiting by their panic, we shall exterminate them completely. This will cool the king's courage and cover us with glory, besides ensuring the success of our mission. The officers all replied that it would be necessary to discuss the matter first with the intendant. Pensiecheo then fell into a passion. It is today, he cried, that our fortunes must be decided. The intendant is only a humdrum civilian, 
who on hearing of our project will certainly be afraid, and everything will be brought to light. An inglorious death is no worthy fate for valiant warriors. All then agreed to do as he wished. Accordingly, as soon as night came on, he and his little band quickly made their way to the barbarian camp. A strong gale was blowing at the time. Pensiacheo ordered ten of the party to take drums and hide behind the enemy's barracks, it being arranged that when they saw flames shoot up, they should begin drumming and yelling with all their might. The rest of his men, armed with bows and crossbows, he posted an ambuscade at the gate of the camp. He then set fire to the place from the windward side, whereupon a deafening noise of drums and shouting arose on the front and rear of the Sung Nu, who rushed out pell-mell in frantic disorder. Pensicheo slew three of them with his own hand, while his companions cut off the heads of the envoy and thirty of his suite. The remainder, more than a hundred in all, perished in the flames. On the following day, Pansiacheo, divining his thoughts, said with uplifted hand, Although you did not go with us last night, I should not think, sir, of taking sole credit for our exploit. This satisfied Kwasun, and Pansiacheo, having sent for Kwang, king of Shan Shan, showed him the head of the barbarian Anvo. The whole kingdom was seized with fear and trembling, which Pansiacheo took steps to allay by issuing a public proclamation. Then, taking the king's sons as hostage, he returned to make his report to Tu Ku. Ho Han Shu, CH 47, FF 1 2. The second is to burn stores. Tumu says, Provisions, fuel, and fodder. In order to subdue the rebellious population of Kiangnan, Cao King recommended Wen Ti of the Sui dynasty to make periodical raids and burn their stores of grain, a policy which in the long run proved entirely successful. The third is to burn baggage trains. An example given is the destruction of Yuan Shao's wagons and impedimenta by Tseo Tseo in 280. The fourth is to burn arsenals and magazines. Tu Mu says that the things contained in arsenals and magazines are the same. He specifies weapons and other implements, bullion and clothing. CF 7. 11. The fifth is to hurl dropping fire amongst the enemy. Tu Yu says in the Tung Tien, to drop fire into the enemy's camp. The method by which this may be done is to set the tips of arrows alight by dipping them into a brazier, and then shoot them from powerful crossbows into the enemy's lines. 2. In order to carry out an attack, we must have means available. Sao Kung thinks that traitors in the enemy's camp are referred to. But C.H.N. Hao is more likely to be right in saying, We must have favorable circumstances in general, not merely traitors to help us. Chia Lin says, We must avail ourselves of wind and dry weather. The material for raising fire should always be kept in readiness. Tumu suggests as material for making fire. Dry vegetable matter reeds, brushwood, straw, grease, oil, etc. Here we have the material cause. Chang Yu says, Vessels for hoarding fire, stuff for lighting fires. 3. There is a proper season for making attacks with fire, and special days for starting a conflagration. 4. The proper season is when the weather is very dry. The special days are those when the moon is in the constellations of the sieve, the wall, the wing, or the crossbar. These are, respectively, the 7th, 14th, 27th, and 28th of the 28 stellar mansions, corresponding roughly to Sagittarius, Pegasus, Crater, and Corvus. For these four are all days of rising wind. 5. In attacking with fire, one should be prepared to meet five possible developments. 6. One when fire breaks out inside the enemy's camp, respond at once with an attack from without. 7. Two if there is an outbreak of fire, but the enemy soldiers remain quiet, bide your time and do not attack. The prime object of attacking with fire is to throw the enemy into confusion. If this effect is not produced, it means that the enemy is ready to receive us. Hence the necessity for caution. 8. 3. When the force of the flames has reached its height, follow it up with an attack, if that is practicable. If not, stay where you are. Tiaseo Kung says, if you see a possible way, advance, but if you find the difficulties too great, retire. 9. 
for if it is possible to make an assault with fire from without do not wait for it to break out within but deliver your attack at a favorable moment tumu says that the previous paragraphs had reference to the fire breaking out either accidentally we may suppose or by the agency of incendiaries inside the enemy's camp but he continues if the enemy is settled in a waste place littered with quantities of grass or if he has pitched his camp in a position which can be burned out we must carry our fire against him at any seasonable opportunity and not await on in hopes of an outbreak occurring within for fear our opponents should themselves burn up the surrounding vegetation and thus render our own attempts fruitless the famously ling once baffled the leader of the sung nu in this way the latter taking advantage of a favorable wind tried to set fire to the chinese general's camp but found that every scrap of combustible vegetation in the neighborhood had already been burnt down on the other hand patia Sei, a general of the yellow turban rebels was badly defeated in 184 A.D. through his neglect of this simple precaution. At the head of a large army he was besieging Changshi, which was held by Huang Fu Sung. The garrison was very small, and a general feeling of nervousness pervaded the ranks, so Huang Fu Sung called his officers together and said, In war, there are various indirect methods of attack, and numbers do not count for everything. The commentator here quotes Sun Tzu, V., five six and ten now the rebels have pitched their camp in the midst of thick grass which will easily burn when the wind blows if we set fire to it at night they will be thrown into a panic and we can make a sortie and attack them on all sides at once thus emulating the achievement of tian tan see page ninety that same evening a strong breeze sprang up so huang fu sung instructed his soldiers to bind reeds together into torches and mount guard on the city walls after which he sent out a band of daring men, who stealthily made their way through the lines and started the fire with loud shouts and yells. Simultaneously, a glare of light shot up from the city walls, and Huang Fu Sung, sounding his drums, led a rapid charge, which threw the rebels into confusion and put them to headlong flight. Ho Han Shu, CH 71. 10. 5. When you start a fire, be to windward of it. Do not attack from the leeward. Chan Yu, following to you, says, When you make a fire, the enemy will retreat away from it. If you oppose his retreat and attack him then, he will fight desperately, which will not conduce to your success. A rather more obvious explanation is given by Tu Mu. If the wind is in the east, begin burning to the east of the enemy, and follow up the attack yourself from that side. If you start the fire on the east side, and then attack from the west, you will suffer in the same way as your enemy. 11. A wind that rises in the daytime lasts long, but a night breeze soon falls. C.F. Lao Tzu is saying, A violent wind does not last the space of a morning. Tao Te Ching, Chapter 23. May Yao C.H.N. and Wang Shi say, A day breeze dies down at nightfall, and a night breeze at daybreak. This is what happens as a general rule. The phenomenon observed may be correct enough but how this sense is to be obtained is not apparent. 12. In every army, the five developments connected with fire must be known, the movements of the stars calculated, and a watch kept for the proper days. Tumu says, We must make calculations as to the paths of the stars, and watch for the days on which wind will rise, before making our attack with fire. Chan Yu seems to interpret the text differently. We must not only know how to assail our opponents with fire, but also be on our guard against similar attacks from them. 13. Hence those who use fire as an aid to the attack show intelligence. Those who use water as an aid to the attack gain an accession of strength. 14. By means of water, an enemy may be intercepted, but not robbed of all his belongings. T.S.A.O. Kung's note is, we can merely obstruct the enemy's road or divide his army, but not sweep away all his accumulated stores. Water can do useful service, but it lacks the terrible destructive power of fire. This is the reason, Chan Yu concludes, why the former is dismissed in a couple of sentences, whereas the attack by fire is discussed in detail. Wu Tzu CH4 speaks thus of the two elements. If an army is encamped on low-lying marshy ground, from which the water cannot run off, and where the rainfall is heavy it may be submerged by a flood. 
if an army is encamped in wild marsh lands thickly overgrown with weeds and brambles and visited by frequent gales it may be exterminated by fire fifteen unhappy is the fate of one who tries to win his battles and succeed in his attacks without cultivating the spirit of enterprise for the result is waste of time and general stagnation this is one of the most perplexing passages in sun tzu tia seo kung says rewards for good service should not be deferred a single day and tu mu if you do not take opportunity to advance and reward the deserving your subordinates will not carry out your commands and disaster will ensue for several reasons however and in spite of the formidable array of scholars on the other side i prefer the interpretation suggested by mei yao chn alone whose words i will quote those who want to make sure of succeeding in their battles and assaults must seize the favorable moments when they come and not shrink on occasion from heroic measures that is to say they must resort to such means of attack of fire water and the like what they must not do and what will prove fatal is to sit still and simply hold to the advantages they have got sixteen hence the saying the enlightened ruler lays his plans well ahead the good general cultivates his resources tumu quotes the following from the san le ch two the warlike prince controls his soldiers by his authority kits them together by good faith and by rewards makes them serviceable if faith decays there will be disruption if rewards are deficient commands will not be respected seventeen move not unless you see an advantage use not your troops unless there is something to be gained fight not unless the position is critical sun tzu may at times appear to be overcautious but he never goes so far in that direction as the remarkable passage in the tao te ching ch sixty nine i dare not take the initiative but prefer to act on the defensive i dare not advance an inch but prefer to retreat a foot eighteen no ruler should put troops into the field merely to gratify his own spleen no general should fight a battle simply out of pique nineteen if it is to your advantage make a forward move if not stay where you are this is repeated from eleven seventeen here i feel convinced that it is an interpolation for it is evident that twenty ought to follow immediately on eighteen twenty anger may in time change to gladness vexation may be succeeded by content twenty one but a kingdom that has once been destroyed can never come again into being the wu state was destined to be a melancholy example of this saying nor can the dead ever be brought back to life twenty two hence the enlightened ruler is heedful and the good general full of caution this is the way to keep a country at peace and an army intact one unless you enter the tiger's lair you cannot get hold of the tiger's cubs chapter thirteen the use of spies one sun tzu said raising a host of a hundred thousand men and marching them great distances entails heavy loss on the people and a drain on the resources of the state the daily expenditure will amount to a thousand ounces of silver cf two one thirteen fourteen there will be commotion at home and abroad and men will drop down exhausted on the highways cf tao te ching ch thirty where troops have been quartered brambles and thorns spring up chan yu has the note we may be reminded of the saying on serious ground gather and plunder why then should carriage and transportation cause exhaustion on the highways the answer is that not victuals alone but all sorts of munitions of war have to be conveyed to the army besides the injunction to forage on the enemy only means that when an army is deeply engaged in hostile territory scarcity of food must be provided against hence without being solely dependent on the enemy for corn we must forage in order that there may be an uninterrupted flow of supplies then again there are places like salt deserts where provisions being unobtainable supplies from home cannot be dispensed with as many as seven hundred thousand families will be impeded in their labor mei yao siegen says men will be lacking at the plow tail the allusion is to the system of dividing land into nine parts each consisting of about fifteen acres the plot in the center being cultivated on behalf of the state by the tenants of the other eight it was here also so tumu tells us that their cottages were built and a well sunk 
to be used by all in common. C2. 12. Note. In time of war, one of the families had to serve in the army, while the other seven contributed to its support. Thus, by a levy of one hundred thousand men reckoning one able-bodied soldier to each family, the husbandry of seven hundred thousand families would be effected. 2. Hostile armies may face each other for years, striving for the victory which is decided in a single day. This being so, to remain in ignorance of the enemy's condition simply because one grudges the outlay of a hundred ounces of silver in honors and emoluments. For spies, is of course the meaning, though it would spoil the effect of this curiously elaborate exordium if spies were actually mentioned at this point. Is the height of inhumanity. Sun Tzu's agreement is certainly ingenious. He begins by adverting to the frightful misery and vast expenditure of blood and treasure which war always brings in its train. Now, unless you are kept informed of the enemy's condition, and are ready to strike at the right moment, a war may drag on for years. The only way to get this information is to employ spies, and it is impossible to obtain trustworthy spies unless they are properly paid for their services. But it is surely false economy to grudge a comparatively trifling amount for this purpose when every day that the war lasts eats up an incalculably greater sum. This grievous burden falls on the shoulders of the poor, and hence Sun Tzu concludes that to neglect the use of spies is nothing less than a crime against humanity. 3. One who acts thus is no leader of men, no present help to his sovereign, no master of victory. This idea, that the true object of war is peace, has its root in the national temperament of the Chinese. Even so far back as 597 BC, these memorable words were uttered by Prince Chuang of the Sichu State. The Chinese character for prowess is made up of the characters for to stay and a spear cessation of hostilities. Military prowess is seen in the repression of cruelty, the calling in of weapons, the preservation of the appointment of heaven, the firm establishment of merit, the bestowal of happiness on the people, putting harmony between the princes, the diffusion of wealth. 4. Thus, what enables the wise sovereign and the good general to strike and conquer, and achieve things beyond the reach of ordinary men, is foreknowledge. That is, knowledge of the enemy's dispositions, and what he means to do. 5. Now this foreknowledge cannot be elicited from spirits. It cannot be obtained inductively from experience. Tumu's note is, Knowledge of the enemy cannot be gained by reasoning from other analogous cases nor by any deductive calculation. Li Siechuan says, Quantities like length, breadth, distance and magnitude are susceptible of exact mathematical determination. Human actions cannot be so calculated. 6. Knowledge of the enemy's dispositions can only be obtained from other men. Mei Yao Siechen has rather an interesting note. Knowledge of the spirit world is to be obtained by divination. Information in natural science may be sought by inductive reasoning. The laws of the universe can be verified by mathematical calculation. But the dispositions of an enemy are ascertainable through spies and spies alone. 7. Hence the use of spies, of whom there are five classes, one local spies, two inward spies, three converted spies, four doomed spies, five surviving spies. 8. When these five kinds of spy are all at work, none can discover the secret system. This is called divine manipulation of the threads. It is the sovereign's most precious faculty. Cromwell, one of the greatest and most practical of all cavalry leaders, had officers styled scout masters, whose business it was to collect all possible information regarding the enemy, through scouts and spies, etc., and much of his success in war was traceable to the previous knowledge of the enemy's moves thus gained. One. 9. Having local spies means employing the services of the inhabitants of a district. Tumu says, In the enemy's country, win people over by kind treatment, and use them as spies. 10. Having inward spies, making use of officials of the enemy. Tumu enumerates the following classes as likely to do good service in this respect. Worthy men who have been degraded from office, criminals who have undergone punishment. Also, Favorite concubines who are greedy for gold, men who are aggrieved at being in subordinate positions, or who have been passed over in the distribution of posts, 
others who are anxious that their side should be defeated in order that they may have a chance of displaying their ability and talents fickle turncoats who always want to have a foot in each boat officials of these several kinds he continues should be secretly approached and bound to one's interests by means of rich presents in this way you will be able to find out the state of affairs in the enemy's country ascertain the plans that are being formed against you and moreover disturb the harmony and create a breach between the sovereign and his ministers the necessity for extreme caution however in dealing with inward spies appears from an historical incident related by hoshi lo shang governor of Aicho, sent his general wei pi to attack the rebel li son of shu in his stronghold at pai after each side had experienced a number of victories and defeats li sun had recourse to the services of a certain petii a native of wu tu he began to have him whipped until the blood came and then sent him off to lo shang whom he was to delude by offering to cooperate with him from inside the city and to give a fire signal at the right moment for making a general assault lo shang confiding in these promises march out all his best troops and placed wei pa and others at their head with orders to attack at petii's bidding meanwhile li xiang's general li xiang had prepared an ambuscade on their line of march and petii having reared long scaling ladders against the city walls now lighted the beacon fire wei po's men raced up on seeing the signal and began climbing the ladders as fast as they could while others were drawn up by ropes lowered from above more than a hundred of lo shang's soldiers entered the city in this way every one of whom was forthwith beheaded li sung then charged with all his forces both inside and outside the city and routed the enemy completely this happened in 303 a.d i do not know where ho shi got the story from it is not given in the biography of li sung or that of his father li tei chin shu ch 120 121 11 having converted spies getting hold of the enemy's spies and using them for our own purposes by means of heavy bribes and liberal promises detaching them from the enemy's service and inducing them to carry back false information as well as to spy in turn on their own countrymen on the other hand si yao shishin says that we pretend not to have detected him but contrive to let him carry away a false impression of what is going on several of the commentators accept this as an alternative definition but that it is not what sun tzu meant is conclusively proved by his subsequent remarks about treating the converted spy generously twenty one s q q ho she notes three occasions on which converted spies were used with conspicuous success one by tian tan in his defense of chi m o c supra page ninety two by chao shi on his march to o u c page fifty seven and by the wily fan chu in two sixty b c when lin pu was conducting a defensive campaign against chin the king of chao strongly disapproved of lin pu's cautious and dilatory methods which had been unable to avert a series of minor disasters and therefore lent a ready ear to the reports of his spies who had secretly gone over to the enemy and were already in fan chu's pay they said the only thing which causes chin anxiety is lest chao kua should be made general lin pu they consider an easy opponent who is sure to be vanquished in the long run now this chao kua was a son of the famous chao shi from his boyhood he had been wholly engrossed in the study of war and military matters until at last he came to believe that there was no commander in the whole empire who could stand against him his father was much disquieted by this overweening conceit and the flippancy with which he spoke of such a serious thing as war and solemnly declared that if ever kua was appointed general he would bring ruin on the armies of chao this was the man who in spite of earnest protests from his own mother and the veteran statesman lin xiang ju was now sent to succeed lin pa needless to say he proved no match for the redoubtable pachi and the great military power of chin he fell into a trap by which his army was divided into two and his communications cut and after a desperate resistance lasting forty-six days during which the famished soldiers devoured one another he was himself killed by an arrow and his whole force amounting it is said to four hundred thousand men ruthlessly put to the sword twelve having doomed spies doing certain things openly for purposes of deception and allowing our own spies to know of them and report them to the enemy tu yu gives the best exposition of the meaning 
we ostentatiously do things calculated to deceive our own spies who must be led to believe that they have been unwittingly disclosed then when these spies are captured in the enemy's lines they will make an entirely false report and the enemy will take measures accordingly only to find that we do something quite different the spies will thereupon be put to death as an example of doomed spies hoshi mentions the prisoners released by pan Cheo in his campaign against yarkand see page one thirty two he also refers to tang chien who in six thirty eighty was sent by tai tsung to lull the turkish khan chi li into fancied security until li ching was able to deliver a crushing blow against him chan yu says that the turks revenged themselves by killing tang chien but this is a mistake for we read in both the old and the new tang history ch fifty eight folios two and ch eighty nine folios eight respectively that he escaped and lived on until six hundred and fifty six liaichi played a somewhat similar part in two o three b c when sent by the king of han to open peaceful negotiations with chi he has certainly more claim to be described a doomed spy for the king of chi being subsequently attacked without warning by han h s i n and infuriated by what he considered the treachery of liaichi ordered the unfortunate envoy to be boiled alive 13. Surviving spies, finally, are those who bring back news from the enemy's camp. This is the ordinary class of spies, properly so called, forming a regular part of the army. Tumu says, Your surviving spy must be a man of keen intellect, though in outward appearance a fool, of shabby exterior, but with a will of iron. He must be active, robust, endowed with physical strength and courage, thoroughly accustomed to all sorts of dirty work able to endure hunger and cold and to put up with shame and ignominy hoshi tells the following story of tashi wu of the sui dynasty when he was governor of eastern qin shin wu of qi made a hostile movement upon shayuan the emperor tai tsu kao tsu sent tashi wu to spy upon the enemy he was accompanied by two other men all three were on horseback and wore the enemy's uniform when it was dark they dismounted a few hundred feet away from the enemy's camp and stealthily crept up to listen until they succeeded in catching the passwords used in the army then they got on their horses again and boldly passed through the camp under the guise of night watchmen and more than once happening to come across a soldier who was committing some breach of discipline they actually stopped to give the culprit a sound cudgeling thus they managed to return with the fullest possible information about the enemy's dispositions and received warm commendation from the emperor who in consequence of their report was able to inflict a severe defeat on his adversary fourteen hence it is that with none in the whole army are more intimate relations to be maintained than with spies tu mu and mei yao chn point out that the spy is privileged to enter even the general's private sleeping tent none should be more liberally rewarded in no other business should greater secrecy be preserved Tu Mu gives a graphic touch. All communication with spies should be carried. Mouth to ear. The following remarks on spies may be quoted from Turin, who made perhaps larger use of them than any previous commander. Spies are attached to those who give them most. He who pays them ill is never served. They should never be known to anybody, nor should they know one another. When they propose anything very material, secure their persons or have in your possession their wives and children as hostages for their fidelity never communicate anything to them but what is absolutely necessary that they should know Two. Fifteen. spies cannot be usefully employed without a certain intuitive sagacity mei yao siegen says in order to use them one must know fact from falsehood and be able to discriminate between honesty and double dealing one she in a different interpretation thinks more along the lines of intuitive perception and practical intelligence tu mu strangely refers these attributes to the spies themselves before using spies we must assure ourselves as to their integrity of character and the extent of their experience and skill but he continues a brazen face and a crafty disposition are more dangerous than mountains or rivers it takes a man of genius to penetrate such so that we are left in some doubt as to his real opinion on the passage sixteen they cannot be properly managed without benevolence and straightforwardness chang yu says 
when you have attracted them by substantial offers you must treat them with absolute sincerity then they will work for you with all their might 17 without subtle ingenuity of mind one cannot make certain of the truth of their reports may yao siegen says be on your guard against the possibility of spies going over to the service of the enemy 18 be subtle be subtle and use your spies for every kind of business cf 6 9 19 if a secret piece of news is divulged by a spy before the time is ripe he must be put to death together with the man to whom the secret was told word for word the translation here is if spy matters are heard before our plans are carried out etc sun tzu's main point in this passage is whereas you kill the spy himself as a punishment for letting out the secret the object of killing the other man is only as chn how puts it to stop his mouth and prevent news leaking any further if it had already been repeated to others this object would not be gained either way sun tzu lays himself open to the charge of inhumanity though tu mu tries to defend him by saying that the man deserves to be put to death for the spy would certainly not have told the secret unless the other had been at pains to worm it out of him twenty whether the object be to crush an army to storm a city or to assassinate an individual it is always necessary to begin by finding out the names of the attendants the aides de camp literally visitors is equivalent as to you says to those whose duty it is to keep the general supplied with information which naturally necessitates frequent interviews with him the doorkeepers and sentries of the general in command our spies must be commissioned to ascertain these as the first step no doubt towards finding out if any of these important functionaries can be won over by bribery twenty one the enemy's spies who have come to spy on us must be sought out tempted with bribes led away and comfortably housed thus they will become converted spies and available for our service twenty two it is through the information brought by the converted spy that we are able to acquire and employ local and inward spies. To you says, through conversion of the enemy's spies we learn the enemy's condition. And Chang Yu says, we must tempt the converted spy into our service, because it is he that knows which of the local inhabitants are greedy of gain, and which of the officials are open to corruption. 23 it is owing to his information again that we can cause the doomed spy to carry false tidings to the enemy chang yu says because the converted spy knows how the enemy can best be deceived twenty four lastly it is by his information that the surviving spy can be used on appointed occasions twenty five the end and aim of spying in all its five varieties is knowledge of the enemy and this knowledge can only be derived in the first instance from the converted spy as explained in 2224 he not only brings information himself but makes it possible to use the other kinds of spy to advantage hence it is essential that the converted spy be treated with the utmost liberality 26 of old the rise of the yin dynasty sun tzu means the shang dynasty founded in 1766 bc its name was changed to Yin by Pan King in 1401. Was due to Ai Qi. Better known as Ai Yin, the famous general and statesman who took part in Xie Ching Tang's campaign against Qi Ke, who had served under the Xiao. Likewise, the rise of the Chou dynasty was due to Lu Ya. Lu Shang rose to high office under the tyrant Chou Hsian, whom he afterwards helped to overthrow. Popularly known as Tai Kung, a title bestowed on him by Wen Wang, he is said to have composed the treatise on war, erroneously identified with the Lu Tao, who had served under the Yin. There is less precision in the Chinese than I have thought it well to introduce into my translation, and the commentaries on the passage are by no means explicit. But, having regard to the context, we can hardly doubt that Sun Tzu is holding up Ai Qi and Lu Ye as illustrious examples of the converted spy, or something closely analogous. His suggestion is that the Xia and Yin dynasties were upset owing to the intimate knowledge of their weaknesses and shortcoming which these former ministers were able to impart to the other side. May Yao Xiechen appears to resent any such aspersion on these historic names. Ayin and Luya, he says, 
were not rebels against the government. Sia could not employ the former, hence Ian employed him. Ian could not employ the latter, hence Ho employed him. Their great achievements were all for the good of the people. Ho Shi is also indignant. How should two divinely inspired men such as I and Lu have acted as common spies? Sun Tzu's mention of them simply means that the proper use of the five classes of spies is a matter which requires men of the highest mental caliber like I and Lu, whose wisdom and capacity qualified them for the task. The above words only emphasize this point. Ho Shi believes then that the two heroes are mentioned on account of their supposed skill in the use of spies. But this is very weak. 27. Hence it is only the enlightened ruler and the wise general who will use the highest intelligence of the army for purposes of spying and thereby they achieve great results. Tumu closes with a note of warning. Just as water, which carries a boat from bank to bank, may also be the means of sinking it, so reliance on spies, while production of great results, is oft times the cause of utter destruction. Spies are a most important element in war, because on them depends an army's ability to move. Chialin says that an army without spies is like a man with ears or eyes. 1. Aids to Scouting. Page 2. 2. Marshal Turin. Page 311. 